Good. Good seeing you. Good to see you too. Ready? Yeah. Shall we pray? Please. Shemit Baba Bruna, Ruha Kocha, Haala Hashari Ra Amin. Baden Bishmeya, Paish Kutushumo, Atim and Kuto, Haura Zaya, Dahid Bishmeya Opera, Halas and Lachmas and Pine and Fadiuma, Shokwangina. Today I have with me one of the youngest, if not the youngest priest in the Assyrian Church of the East, which is an ancient church founded uh, as a Christian denomination in the first century Mesopotamia by the Apostle St. Thomas, aka Doubting Thomas. The church uses classical Syriac as its uh, language for liturgy, which is the old language for modern Assyrian, which is the language that we speak here at the Assyrian Church. Uh, Father Andrew Aziz, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. It is, uh, it is my honor and a privilege and a blessing to be here with you uh, on this podcast. Uh, I've heard a lot of good things. I've seen a lot of good things. And uh, I'm on me and you go back a long time. So I think this is, I was, I was very excited when you reached out. I thought this would be a good opportunity for me to sit down with uh, one of my former, we were just talking about it before we got mm -hmm. on this cast. Uh, we, we've been, I've known you for almost at least 20, 20 years. years now. And, you know, we've served together in the youth committee and Kind of seeing each other just grow up together so it's yeah. it's a blessing and it's it's an opportunity here to to discuss the faith to discuss uh discuss the church and everything that has to do with theology i don't let i'm ready i'm excited for your questions so. yeah absolutely and the first things i actually want to get into first is like like you said i want to acknowledge this because this yeah. is actually very unique like we actually started as a youth members in mm -hmm. the same church group and then we went to the same universities that's yeah yeah, yeah that's true we kind were at the same engineering at the same yeah. time and then we went on business trips together one time to portland as engineers yes. and then this is where god led us now to have a conversation yeah about him. glory glory to his name I very mean, cool yeah. and uh so where i want to start first is your credentials uh let the audience know a little bit about you and mm -hmm. then we can start going into a lot of the theological things. What I really want to talk about today is to preface with the audience is there's a lot of uh, points that try to debunk Jesus mm -hmm. Christ, uh, his existence, his divinity, all these things. I want to go through these points one by one, acknowledge the Darwinist points of view and uh, the atheistic points of view, and then to see what rebuttals you may have, proof, uh, some things that you may say, you know, they have good points. Mm -hmm. So I want to get into that. But first, let me ask you, what made you want to become a priest and give up a quote-unquote normal lifestyle well first and foremost before we begin anything um we give glory in his name and everything is for for his glory for his honor um and here on earth uh, a lot of things that we do and a lot of the just life in general we have to view it as um you know just raising glory and and, and following the will of god um so for me um, and you know this very well, knowing how you know I've grown up and been involved in the church. Um, it was a passion of mine since a young age. Um, more so, it was an interest. Uh, when I was a young, about 13, 14 years old, um, when I started as a, as a young lector in the church, uh, Aruya, um, I just had the interest. Um, the history of the church was interesting to me. Um, the, the apostolic succession, um, I think the first thing that really gauged my interest was watching the ordination or the consecration of His Holiness, then His Grace, Mar Awarul, and he became the first U.S.-born bishop um, back in 2008, and we watched it live on television, and that sort of piqued my interest as a, I was about 13 years old. We had mm -hmm. just moved to Arizona, um, and we were studying with Father Andu, who was the parish priest of Mar Yosef at the time. Um, so there was a group of us, but for whatever reason, um, I was just interested in the church and its traditions and its customs, its liturgy, its, its history. But it wasn't until more recently where I saw the, the calling or the vocation of the priesthood. It was always something that was in the back of my mind, but I never, I don't think I ever took it seriously or I never looked at it as a thing that, you know, I could approach and I could do um, just for factor of reasons. Um, one of them being my my studies uh, in college, like you mentioned earlier, um, I was studying for my mechanical systems engineering degree. Um, I was pursuing engineering. I was I planned to get married, um, which I happily am now for two and a half years to my lovely wife Ninwe, um, who was also part of the youth group, and that's where we met and 
uh, everything. So you hear things constantly from other priests, from you know the some of your spiritual fathers, the priests that you look up to as mentors, as role models, um, and they're constantly you know throwing this conversation that you know we need priests, we need younger priests, the church needs priests, the church is in a situation, is in a dire environment in America where we need priests in the West, specifically really. the Assyrian Church. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and even the patriarch's messages during the youth conferences would have to do, may, he wouldn't specifically mention serving as priest, but he would always mention or discuss uh, and emphasize the, the answering the call, um, answering your vocation, mm -hmm. reaching out. One of our themes for, I don't know if you remember this or not, but 2018, mm -hmm. our theme was, here I am, send me, uh, from, the, from the book of Isaiah. So when, when I... When I heard that and I, you know, I, I prayed about it um, and I saw that, you know, why, why can't I? Why shouldn't I? Maybe this is what God is calling me for. Um, and so through prayer, through discussion with spiritual fathers, through discussion with um, those priests that I've been serving with uh, in, the, in the National Executive Committee, discuss, discussions with my family, my wife in particular, it was difficult. It was a difficult decision. It's something that you know you're unsure of. You you don't know what is going to happen. Um, right. uh, you don't the uncertainty of like the the, the business side of things of, of leaving your job and mm -hmm. committing full time and um, just the so many things like you're mentioning of of giving up the normal lifestyle to to serve as a priest. Classes I was attending with with some of the priests and some of the deacons um, that have to do with the the canons of the church, the liturgy of the church. Um, there's so much more that the priest has to do. Uh, the priest needs to learn the prayers. And so I was doing that. Um, I'm enrolled in the Nasibis Theological College. Um, I've been enrolled there for, for almost two years now. So I took those steps. Um, and then finally, um, it was about 2023, um, Archdeacon, then Core Bishop Giorgis Petrosu, who is the parish priest in, in LA, Los Angeles, who is now our diocese overseer, um, we had a conversation and, and he said, if it's something that you really want to do and if it's something that you are you know, sure about, um, then you let us know and we'll work together and we'll get you to that next step. Mm -hmm. So he went above and beyond in, in helping guide um, and taking those next steps and really instilling the confidence. Um, and so, you know, glory to be to God. Um, June 30th, I was ordained to the priesthood. Um, to answer, I know I kind of went way back, but to answer the question of nor leaving a normal life, um, again, we're called, as I mentioned in the beginning, a life, pursuing a life of holiness, uh, pursuing a relationship, a walk with Christ in, in our life. And um, did I enjoy engineering? Did I enjoy that? Um, sure, yeah, I did. I, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't, it wasn't my passion. I didn't mm -hmm. feel um, the passion for it like I do with the priesthood. So there was a yearning to become a member of yeah, the, the, yeah, the church. Yeah, there, there was, there was. And the more I, the more I studied, the more I um, spent time in, in, you know, thinking, pondering about it, praying about it, the more that yearning grew. Yeah. But, um, so that was a confidence. And I think that's the Holy Spirit that's sort of convicting and, and letting you know, like, this is for you. Um, you never really know. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be in your next question, but you never really know, like, what is, what is there? Uh, what, what is this the will? Is this my doing? Is this, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Until you just, until you do it, you know, you have the free will that God gives us and you have these feelings, these emotions, these desires. And mm -hmm. um, when you're doing it with pure intentions, uh, when you're doing it with, with prayer and with thoughtfulness and you're approaching it um, the right way, uh, you really, you, you'll start to know gradually as you enter it, um, the moment the patriarch or that, that uh, the celebrant is, is consecrating you and he's putting his hand on your head and he's saying the prayers and he's lifting you up onto the altar, um, then you know that this is, this is what's meant for me. So that, I think, surpasses and trumps um, all my normal lifestyle. The normalcy that I have to kind of leave behind, I think as Assyrians, we know there's, there's certain things that, you know, um, you wouldn't see me you know, dancing, you wouldn't see mm -hmm. me like doing those things, which as a deacon, you know, very well, I, I used to do. And um, very well. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're one of the first uh, people that taught me how to dance. Actually. Really? Back in the day. Yeah. You, you dance classes here in the halls back in the day before conferences would kick off. You're, you guys were 
We're that's the leaders uh, for me. That's a that's an honor. That's an honor. I know my brother is a lot better than I am. So so that was like those, things like that. Um, there's other things that you know I I, I don't want to get into the list of things that you. Mm. Uh, but but you're always a priest. You're always a priest. Um, so the, the way you dress, the way you approach people, the way you speak, the way you, you know, every interaction, um, people no longer look at you as just Andrew. You're right. Kasha Andrew. You're I remember one of the first father. days uh, when you were ordained, you stuck your hand off to dap us up like this. Yeah. And then Alex looks at me and he goes, is this a sin if I dap him up? <laughs> and I was like, are you sticking his head up? Bro? I, Go I for think, it. I, yeah, that, I still do that a lot. I, yeah. have to, I don't know if that's something that I have to change, but... But it goes um, into my next question. Yeah. Are you the youngest priest in the Assyrian Church of the East? Currently, I think so. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I am. I know uh, there's a few priests that are in their early 30s. You're um, in your late 20s. But I am 29. There mm-hmm. was There's Father Edde in Iran, who I think he's now in Armenia. Um, he was one of our um, instructors. He was, he was one of our teachers. Um, we, were, we were having classes with him via Zoom. And I say we because uh, Father Ninos Adam, who is the parish priest, of St. Mary's and surprise me and him were uh, doing a lot of our studies together. So Father Ed Day is also in his, in his early 30s, but yeah. I think that's 29. I think I am. I'm, I might be the baby of the group. I am the baby of the group. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. So I actually really want to get into the religious side of the okay, conversations. My first question that I want to kick off is, yeah, did the Virgin Mary have other children besides Jesus of Nazareth? No, she did not. No. So there is a lot of speculation and a lot of that comes more so after the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. Um, The early church fathers and the early church writings that we have um, all indicate a perpetual virginity of the Virgin Mary. Um, Then who's James the Just? So James the Just is known as the brother of our Lord. Um, He is one of the first bishops in Jerusalem. He is known for his, the name just comes from his righteousness, his life of uh, piety. Um, and again, he was, he was also martyred um, in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. James the just, and the, the term brother, uh, you'll see it a lot of times in scripture when it says uh, Jesus and his brothers, or Mary and Jesus' brothers. And um, it's, it's a term, uh, you know, in our vocabulary, in the English vocabulary, we read it as brother. Um, but in the ancient text in ancient Greek and Hebrew, uh, we see that word also being used when describing the relationship between Abraham and Lot. And we know that Abraham and Lot were not brothers, but they were rather uncle and nephew. Um, And so in the early texts, in the early scriptures, uh, we look at the brothers of our Lord and James the just being one of them as two things, either close relatives, cousins, Mm -hmm. what have you, or being children of Joseph prior to um, his betrothal to Mary. Um, and so we stand very firm on the uh, perpetual virginity of, of St. Mary. Why? And, why? Why does that matter? So uh, it's, it has to do with the orthodoxy. And when I mean orthodox, I mean the correct or the true faith. Um, the, those things that have been passed down from Christ to the apostles, to the early church, to us today, um, confirmed and guaranteed by the Holy Spirit, that which is God, um, that which is active and alive in the church to today, um, it guarantees the, the authenticity of our faith. When you begin to make changes, when you begin to make, when you begin to make revisions on the faith that has been passed down, you're then tampering with the authenticity, mm-hmm. the verification, the guarantor of the faith. Um, and there's, there's three things that, that, that you're, you're doing then. You're, the, the faith itself has to do with salvation. True faith leads to salvation. And that true faith, it's not something that man has created. It's not something that man just took and started implementing. But rather, it came directly from Christ through the apostles all the way down to today. Um, And so part of that authenticity has to do with some of these things where we have tradition that is, that we may not find in scripture. Um, Some of the gospel writers say that there were things that cannot be filled in these books. John ends his uh, gospel with, there are many things that if if they were written, cannot be contained in the books. So we have this tradition um, with a capital T. Does that mean all the minute details? There's, is that what he means? 
the the traditions or you mean like the he said all the that things are, that cannot be contained all the things that cannot be contained whether it was other miracles whether it was other works there's just um, so much stuff they there couldn't were so record many things everything. yes okay and that has to do with the the vastness of and the complexity of everything that has to do with with christ and theology mm -hmm. but when you look at from this perspective of of sacred tradition or apostolic tradition we call it with a capital t uh, you have the lowercase t that is traditions that is sort of man-made uh, they're not wrong, they're not incorrect. Um, and you could look at those, for example, would be um, something to do with like Dukhrana or the commemoration um, of certain saints that you know, certain, certain villages um, will celebrate or commemorate uh, a certain saint. In our traditions, in the Syrian tradition, we do uh, the Kadin, the Kaleche, the, the mm -hmm. pastries for. So those would be lowercase T traditions. But when we capitalize T tradition, and we start talking about apostolic tradition, that which has to do with the authenticity of our faith, um, that which we've received, again, like I said, through the apostles, through the Holy Spirit, that which is guaranteeing our faith. And that apostolic tradition has to do with our salvation. Uh, and you look at things like the sacraments, you look at things like baptism, you mm -hmm. look at things like the priesthood. Those are the, the traditions that have to be maintained and kept because those are the things that were given and passed down from Christ to the apostles to the early church to today. So in a person's personal journey through their religion, the religious sect of Christianity that mm -hmm. they select. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there's a vast majority of them, Protestant, Baptists, Presbyterian, Catholics, yeah. Orthodox. Um, the Assyrian church technically isn't those. It's, it's yeah. kind of its own thing, but it has very Orthodox rooted traditions also it has catholic in the title but that just means universal it doesn't yes. literally mean the catholic church under the vatican um does it court okay let me word it like this will i go to hell believing jesus had a biological brother no, no. so why is it important that we differentiate the details if you if you begin compromising certain details you're compromising then many aspects and many layers of the faith. Okay, so it's just so, to keep the the traditions and the written history straight so that there is no tampering about anything at all whatsoever. That's why it's very important to state stuff like this. Yeah, because it, not just written, but oral and, and written. Mm. Those traditions that have been passed down. St. Paul also mes mentions in, his, in one of his letters about keeping the traditions that have been passed down to you. Mm -hmm. So those can be oral, uh, spoken down, or you know, written and, and handed down that way as well. Um, so that that's why we have to be very wary of of what we're willing to um, to compromise, willing to sort of differentiate, accept this uh, you know this truth over this other truth. Uh, the truth that we have, and this is again going back to the the authenticity. The importance of the churches, the orthodoxy, the apostolic churches, is because again we've we go back and I'm going to repeat this I think a couple times the 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 apostolicity that it's through the apostles that have received directly from Christ, and the apostles through the the many the seventy apostles that went out and began preaching and and establishing the early church. Um, based on their eyewitness, their, they heard, they saw Christ, they mm -hmm. saw Christ resurrected. They um, learned directly from the, from the apostles of Christ who were with him for three years. So those truths are then passed down and they remain and they're reminded and they're solidified and they're guaranteed, they're verified by the Holy Spirit that remains in the church. And we're going to get into that more yeah. so than just on the spiritual and faith side. We're actually going to go into the historical and proof side of it okay. in the materialistic world. Um, but I want to first understand something I think is very important. Why do Christians need to be baptized in order to take the body and blood of Christ? Okay. So baptism, we have to look at what baptism is and you have to look at what the Eucharist is. Uh, the body and blood of Christ being the Eucharist. Um, the baptism, we receive it. One, it's for the remission of sin. That is one of the many factors, one of mm -hmm. the many uh, gracious gifts that we've received when we receive baptism. It's not just forgiveness of sin because um, then you start talking about infant baptism and that it's, that's its own um, sort of argument there or, or debate. Um, 
But when we receive the inf- when we receive this the baptism, mm-hmm. we're receiving the Holy Spirit. When we're receiving this adoption into this family of God, and when we receive that baptism and we become members of the one body, then you are you you receive the inheritance. You receive um, the entry, the initiation into receiving the other sacraments. Now, why is that? Because when we're receiving the Eucharist, participating in the Eucharist during the liturgy, we have the the part in the Eucharist where we say, whoever has not received the sign of life, let him depart. Whoever does not receive it. Exactly. Um, So that part, we are now entering a spiritual realm. The, The celebration of the Holy Eucharist during the liturgy, the rite of the liturgy, you are entering into a, a kingdom on earth. Yeah. Um, and so to enter into that kingdom, you have to have received the baptism. So that's actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I actually have it right here in Lashley with Mamaldita Nizza. If you yeah. have not taken, if you have not been baptized the part, I actually wanted to bring that up because I, I personally, and I know that there are reasons as to why, and you're going to get into it. Yeah. I have a problem with that. Not in like, like, a problem like as into the point where I want to leave the religion or anything like that. I just like, it, it's very hard for me to understand. I'm hoping you can make me un- understand it. You can't tell me that if Jesus Christ was walking this earth today, mm-hmm. if he came back and there was a person who wanted to get to know him, who wasn't baptized, who wasn't a Christian, maybe they're a Muslim or a Jew or they're uh, Gentiles, they would refer them to as back in the day. And he, he they saw Christ and they would go up to him. Christ wouldn't say, you can't speak to me or sit with me until you get baptized. I, have, I, I just have a hard time believing that. Mm-hmm. So why is it that if a person really wants to come to know Christ, but they're not baptized, they haven't gone through the traditions, they mm-hmm. haven't, uh, they, don't, they don't have understanding maybe of it. They don't have anyone in their lives to go through that. I, I, we're fortunate enough to have parents who have put us into the church at the beginning and they did all the rituals. Some people yeah. don't have that. Yeah. So what if they then wanted to take the body and blood of Christ but uh, they get denied it because they weren't baptized. Mm-hmm. I personally, could be wrong, uh, don't believe Christ would reject anybody for wanting them to do that. Okay, so there's, there's a couple of things that are, that are I don't want to say wrong, but the, if they approach, are, tear apart. the approach there is that by receiving the Eucharist, we get to know Christ, mm-hmm. right? So that is, in a, in a way, that is the completeness. That is the spiritual intimacy that we're having. Uh, one of the church fathers mentions that just as husband and wife, nobody outside of the husband and wife that have been blessed by God through the church um, can participate in their um, coming together. It's the same way through the baptism, we as children of God, we as the bride of Christ, as the one body, when we receive the body and blood of our Lord, it's a spiritually intimate coming together. And so nobody outside of that, of that body can participate in it. That's from a spiritual perspective. Number two, when we want to know the Lord, mm-hmm. our first step, and this is part of the, the, the baptism as well. When we receive baptism, the first thing they do is they give that, bap- the, that who has received baptism, they give them then the body and blood of Christ. Um, it was part of the, the rite of baptism for infants as well. It's not mm. practiced as much today, but um, for adult baptism, the moment they receive baptism, but what are the re- requirements of baptism? Then for an adult Baptist, that who is receiving baptism, they need to know Christ. They have to go through catechism. They need to know the faith. They need to kn- so there's a, there's a period of, of catechism, even the liturgy of the church. It's not only for those that have received baptism. The first part of it is for those that have, uh, that are wanting to learn about the faith and they come. That's why the first part is the readings from the Old Testament, the readings of the, the uh, St. Paul's letters, and then you have the reading of the, of the gospel. Then they're dismissed. So even for those that want to be initiated into the family, into the body, they, res- they, they go, there's a period of, of catechism where they're learning, they're getting to know Christ through the scriptures by the counsel of a spiritual father, then they receive the baptism and then they can receive the body and blood of Christ. It's not so much that, you know, you can't receive the body, please, by all means, but these are the requirements because by receiving the body and blood of Christ, St. Paul is also mentioning that 
if you receive it unworthily, meaning you haven't confessed, you mm. haven't um, been baptized, you haven't been baptized, you have you don't know what you're receiving in its fullness, then you are you are guilty of of receiving it. So we have to receive it really with pure conscience, with a pure intention. We have to go knowing what we're receiving. And so that part, that, that happens when we've been catechized, when we've, when we've been taught, when we've been baptized. Then in our body, being individual members, but as one body, during the celebration of the liturgy, then we go. And in that going forward, we're by the physical action of walking to the altar and to receive the body and blood. That's our outward expression of confessing that we are sinners, that we are dependent on the body and blood of Christ for the washing. So, so let's say there's two people. There's one person who hasn't been baptized, but they want to receive the body and blood of Christ. Yeah. And there's a person who's gone through catechism. catechism. They've been baptized maybe even as a child, mm -hmm. but they come to church with a wickedness in their heart right yes. before they take uh, the body and blood of Christ. Yes. You know, I, it's just common sense that you need to take it with an open heart, forgive the people that wronged you, all these things mm -hmm. that we've been over it a million times, but for the people who don't know this, I want to re-emphasize it to yeah, them. Absolutely. You're supposed to take it with a pure heart. Mm -hmm. um, who's more worthy then to take the body and blood of Christ? A person who hasn't been baptized, but they have a pure heart, or a person who has a, let's, for lack of better terms, dirty heart, uh, who's gone through all of the rituals? Yeah. Def uh, I, would, I would go with the, the person that has the pure heart. Mm. Yeah, the pure heart. But again, it's it, it, it. There are still the requirements. There are still that person has the Lord that he has to answer to. The person that has the wicked heart, right? Nobody knows the heart but God. Mm -hmm. And so, so we look at certain things like that. But God ultimately is the judge. So there's you know so many, and we've I've, I think I've mentioned this probably in my sermons too. So many of us have been coming to church for so many years. And we've received the body and blood of Christ and we receive the Eucharist, but we don't know what we're receiving. And we leave the church the same that we, when we enter the church. And so there is this condition of, of heart that, that humans, I think we need to really reflect on and, and look at. And we focus a lot on the traditions and the traditions aren't bad. We focus so much on the, on the rituals and the rituals aren't bad, but all of them need to guide us to having a pure heart and walking in the spirit with with our Lord, so that's um, ultimately that's what we need to we need to get down to. And and I pray that the person who hasn't received baptism they receive baptism because if they knew and if they know and if they have somebody that can t tell them the importance of receiving the baptism, they would be happily going receiving it because they already have the the other requirement that is a pure heart. They're going and they confess they're receiving that that inheritance of being children of of God. So. So why is, correct me if I'm wrong, getting re-baptized as an adult in the Assyrian mm -hmm. church something that's like a no-no? The most simple answer is because God is one. God is one. Uh, St. Paul mentions one baptism. One Lord, one, G one, one God, one Lord, one baptism. Well, the argument is, is okay, so let's look at the pros. I understand yeah. why they do it for babies. My dad used to tell me this all the time. It's like, God forbid if the baby passed away mm -hmm. before being baptized, making the decision mm -hmm. as an adult, they lost the opportunity. They can't get accepted by Christ because yeah. they weren't baptized. That's why you do it as a baby. Okay. Yes. That's, that's a legitimate argument. The other side of it is, well, they don't know what they're doing. They aren't conscious. They don't have a relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. So why can't they get baptized as a baby and then do it again when they actually know what the process is, when they're not being forced to do it without their will? Because then you're, you're indirectly saying that the first baptism you received was, was, just, was just a ritual, was just a tradition, was just some, something celebratory. Now you can do it again because now you understand. We never fully understand. We never fully grasp, right? Con we're constantly... In this, in this environment where we're constantly following and learning and growing because mm -hmm. God is, is the knower of all things. And we are within our human nature limited in understanding. Uh, God says that his ways are much greater. Just as heaven and earth are, are far apart, that's how much his ways are different than our ways and our understanding is different than his understanding. So, that's that's the part of it that we'll never understand. You know, if you if you take an adult today and t tell them, okay, now you tell me if you understand what your baptism is, put them in the put them in the church and have them receive the baptism. They can't. Right. Um, and and it's not that it's a bad thing, but 
It's a bad thing. What we're saying, what we're saying is that the, the baptism you receive as a child is is not just for the for the forgiveness of sin. What we're doing is we're removing the Adam, that which is of the flesh, mm-hmm. that that Adam nature uh, we received that caused us to be born outside of this relationship with God. And so that first Adam is removed, and we are then clothed with the second Adam, which is Christ through grace, through the Holy Spirit, through the immersion of the water and the holy, the calling on the Holy Spirit. So then that child has then received the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. That child has been imparted the gifts that come with the Holy Spirit. And so that child is then raised in this, in this, in this, you know, this gracious, merciful relationship with, with God. And it's on the church, it's on the family, it's on the parents to make sure that that child is raised in that understanding and grows close. And ha- the, 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 the faith of the parents, the faith of the church, the response, they both have roles and responsibilities mm-hmm. for that child. So that's ultimately where we're getting to is is that that initial baptism that they've received is one. Um, there is no need for a second baptism after they've turned 18 and then they need to go and receive baptism again. That initial baptism is cleansing, is regenerating, and it's, it's providing the, the, the entry, it's initiating them into the life of, of the church, the spiritual life, and they become heirs and, and inheritors of, of the kingdom that has been um, that has been won by Christ on, on the cross for us. Can anyone baptize anybody? No, that also is uh, limited to the presbyters, um, the, the, the ancient um, church. Again, that was also through the, the offices of the presbyter and the bishop. Even actually in, in the ancient church, it was reserved only for the bishop. The bishop was the only, the office of the bishop was the only office that could, um, that could baptize. Why? Because again, it was given to the apostles. The apostles were baptizing um, when Christ gave them the Holy Spirit, when Christ um, gave them the instruction to go out and to, and to preach and to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He did not give it to everybody. He gave it to the apostles. And the apostles then went out and through this succession, through the laying on of hands, they also gave it to those that were receiving the same rank as them. So they established in the early church the three offices that were the deacon, that were the presbyter, the priest, and then the bishop. And so each had their own responsibility. Hmm. Not everybody that came could just become a deacon, priest, or bishop, and then they had their own gifts. They had their own responsibilities. The deacon couldn't do what the priest did. Right. The priest couldn't do they what the priest did. They have rank, like exactly. anything. So then how about if a person who gets baptized by someone they thought had rank, mm-hmm. or in the, what, the way we say it is derga mm-hmm. in the church, uh, authority to do yes. so, they thought this person had it, but they really don't. Yeah. They, they don't have any responsibilities. They, they weren't accepted formally into a church group. No one gave them the blessing to do yeah. so. And then that person's going into church, taking the body, blood of Christ their whole entire lives. They don't know that. Yeah. So w- do we know what to do in that situation? Yeah, those people, um, again, it goes on the inyat, we say the, the conscience or the, 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 the purpose, right? The, that person's inyat, his, his intention. intentions. Mm-hmm. Um, if that person who has received baptism by a non-valid, non-valid priest um, that person is not guilty of that baptism that they've received because they didn't know. Um, but if it comes to a point where they find out, oh, this person was not, did not have the authority to administer baptism, um, then it's their responsibility to go to a consecrated priest, presbyter, um, that they can then receive baptism. And in that case, it wouldn't be a second baptism. It would be a first legitimate baptism. So the the way we go about things, and again, it has to do with the order, the structure, the validation, the guaranteeing, the verification of our faith. Um, if you know, we just pull somebody from the street and they don't have the valid uh, credentials uh, to go and baptize, uh, that we, we can't accept their baptism. So the Church of the East, we accept valid baptism of presbyters from any apostolic orthodox um, churches apostolic 
churches that have the apostolic traditions and the, um, the, the sacraments. Yeah. That's, that's how we... I mean, I know every church has their own traditions. The Catholic Church, communion, you have to have communion usually around the age of 10 before you can take the yeah. body and blood of Christ, which is usually the cracker. They don't really give the, the blood. Um, I grew up, half of my Sundays would be a Syrian church, mm-hmm. or, or like half of the month would be a Syrian church, half of the month would be Roman Catholic. Okay. So we, we would get the best of both worlds. We would mm-hmm. see how, because we were baptized in a was Catholic it, church. Did you guys, was it like the Chaldean rite? Or no. Was it, it was just straight? It was, you know, like it was Latin. Roman Catholic. It was uh, English or Latin. St. Andrews in Arizona. Okay. Yeah, it was not Chaldean. Okay. But we were baptized. Me and my brother, Thomas, we were baptized in Chaldean churches. Yeah, Tuma. Um, He was baptized in Scottsdale. I was baptized in Modesto. But uh, so we we grew up with both Assyrian church and Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And we didn't, I didn't, we didn't take communion. Our grandmother passed away uh, around the same time we were being enrolled in those classes. But we would still come to Catholic church and we would take the body and blood of Christ. The Assyrian church, the, both. Okay, both. We would take the body and blood of Christ in both, and we. But we, you're not supposed to take it unless so you, you have had communion. First, you have your first communion. First communion in the Catholic Church, okay. which we never did. Yeah, uh, we had a lot of uh, personal stuff going on in our lives that you know took us down different routes. Parents got busy, and so we just didn't get our first communion. To me, th- I didn't care about that because I had my right in the Assyrian Church. I had I've been baptized, mm-hmm. and so. Is it invalid of my taking the body and blood of Christ in the Catholic Church, but it's valid in the Assyrian Church? Like, how does that work? No, so th- those uh, those two things as well um, have to do more of like a Christological um, understanding from both churches. So you have the the Assyrian Church and the the Catholic Church back in the '90s. Uh, the late His Holiness Mardenha and the late. Uh, Pope John Paul II, uh, they drafted, and they, with, along with other prelates of both churches, um, they drafted certain documents mm-hmm. that began this dialogue between the Assyrian Church and the Roman Catholic Church. Mm. Um, and, and part of it had to do with receiving Eucharist, uh, its members receiving Eucharist in both churches. Um, in times of circumstance and need and things like that, um, it, it okayed uh, an Assyrian church member to go and receive Eucharist in the Catholic church and vice versa. Um, and so there's nothing wrong, again, as, as, a, as a child or as a family that, you know, is, is, uh, is faithful to both, both churches. There's nothing wrong with um, somebody receiving in the Assyrian church and then going into the Catholic church and receiving or vice versa. The sacred mushroom in the cross theory. Yeah. By yeah. John you, M. Allegro. You, you brought this up to me. I, I had no idea what this was. I saw it on your notes. Yeah. And I, I thought, okay, I got to look this up a little bit. What did so, you think about it? It's insane. Well, like, let me read the, what, what it is. Okay. So it's an argument by a man named John M. Allegro. Yeah. Uh, he argued Jesus never existed as a historical figure, but was rather a mythological creation of early Christians under the influence of psychoactive mushroom extracts, such as psilocybin mm-hmm. or that. Everyone, everyone who was taking psilocybin was hallucinating, essentially, is this guy's theory. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesus was a giant mushroom. That's why it's called the mushroom and the cross theory. Okay. Um, everyone was basically tripping back in the days. Yeah. What do you think of that theory? That is, in, that is insanity. That is, I mean, from the, I don't want to get too, I'm not going to get vulgar or anything like that. Um, that is, it is rejected by the church. Um, that theory is, mm-hmm. has no basis anywhere. Um, for a few reasons. So ju- but just beside, you know, if you stand from, from a spiritual and theological perspective and you look at this person and the theory that he presents, it's, it's heresy. Uh, the church would right away reject it. But if people want like some sort of rebuttal, I had a little bit of a research Please. The, the week that you sent me. Yeah. Um, so just a couple things. Uh, number one is the historical and linguistic inaccuracies that John uh, this Mr. Allegro guy had on his on these things. So there was um, number one. There's no evidence in Scripture or the early tradition, like we said, that have anything to do with um, any biblical figure uh, taking any hallucinogen or psychedelic to make their basic basis, their declaration of faith, based on a different uh, perspective or, or this you know out of mind experience based on those things. Um, my my research led me to find that his own um, linguistics and things like that, his study on certain uh, topics, he had a 
he had a study done on Sumerian, um, early Sumerian history, that the language uh, that he was trying to like um, formulate based on his his own interpretations of those manuscripts was debunked by linguistic scholars and, and early historians and archaeologists as well. And then again, the archaeological evidence that doesn't show any um, evidence of early biblical figures taking psychedelics to make their claims on the faith, uh, whereas there have been many um, pieces of evidence that show their basic or the basis of faith um, that, that ties to historical belief of the incarnation, mm -hmm. the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Which we're going to get into very detailed yeah. conversation about that very yeah. soon. The reason why I bring this up, yeah. uh, just so people know, is not that because I think it's a legitimate theory. Yeah. It's because it's one of the argument points that people use to discredit Jesus' divinity. Mm -hmm. So what they say is that uh, people back then were tripping uh, the, the, the story of Moses meeting the bush, the bush was actually excreting a psychedelic substance into the air and that mm -hmm. he wasn't talking to God. He was just having an acid trip, basically an experience. What I want to say to those people is that you have to consider one thing. Even if that were true, that one person was experiencing a psychedelic experience uh, through whatever natural chemicals they may have encountered by accident, mm -hmm. n that means that they're going to have their own personal high their own personal psych psychoactive experience you won't all see and hear the same things yeah so the fact that there's multiple eyewitnesses different accounts and they all saw the same things discredits the fact that they were all tripping at the same time because you know, yeah. they would all see different monsters signs symbols yeah that's just it's just silly on its face yeah. uh, i had if you look at the 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 gospel writers uh Luke was a physician. Matthew was a tax collector. Just the fact that they had different, you know, backgrounds, but they their writings coincide. Their writings um, have have two different audiences, and their writings um, share the same stories. Their the the goal and 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 where they're leading to um, all have to do with you know Christ and his salvation and how he came. And you know the the, the writings match the the sources match and them themselves um, to say, like you mentioned that, you know, they were on psychedelics or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Just, it does, it, it's, 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 de it's debunked. It's, it has no basic, he was probably on psychedelics. Oh, for sure. He, but, but if it's so like silly, that, so. why do people who are as smart as Joe Rogan, the reason why I found out this theory in the first place yeah. is from listening to the Joe Rogan experience. Yeah. He brought this up multiple times. And I was like, man, like for a guy who's so smart, who's done so much for the world, uh, indirectly and directly, how can you even like entertain the ridiculousness of this mm -hmm. theory? In the second century, there's a saint um, whose name is Saint Arrhenius of Lyons, Leon, um, and he mentions heresy, heretics, and how heretics, a lot of them were scholars, a lot of them in the early church, you're talking second, third century, mm -hmm. um, and he's writing about how, he, I was reading upon uh, the apostolic tradition, and he's writing with regards to apostolic tradition, how the heretics, with their vast amount of knowledge, don't accept the truth that is given to them via the Holy Spirit, via the church, and continue to try and find a truth more than the truth. It's like evolutionists and Darwinists. And so, and so without accepting that this is a matter of the Holy Spirit, this is a matter of something that has been given, it is divinely inspired, it is given to us um, through man, but by a creator, mm -hmm. by a divine and a complex system. And so they can't fathom that, they can't believe in that. And so they're constantly trying to find something greater, something more than what that is. And, you know, sometimes we have to take a step back and look at it from a simplistic point of view and just say, and accept it for what it is. And it, that takes faith. Uh, a lot of times you can't fully understand, you can't fully grasp certain situations. You mentioned Moses and the burning bush. Mm -hmm. You know, from, from a perspective, from an outside perspective, a lot of times it just takes faith in, in reading that and trusting that this is something that, that did take place, that this is something that did happen. Then to come up with something that is, you know, to, to assume or to say that this person was taking psychedelics and this person was high and this person yeah. was, you know, just making stuff up. And we're going to get to, I think, some of those 
yeah. um, some of those other things. But it, it takes a lot for all of these things to cross-reference. It actually takes more faith to believe in that stuff because there's exactly, less evidence exactly. for what the traditional Christian uh, theology teaches. Yeah. That's backed by documentation. And we're going to get into it, like you said. Yeah. yeah. So the next question I have then is, why do secular individuals not take the Bible with the same credibility that they take other written documents of antiquity with? Mm -hmm. um, again, I think it has to do with, with the fact that it's the truth. Yeah. Um, Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, he sent the spirit of truth. And so there's always, the scriptures are truth, and the truth lives within the means of, of the church, the apostolic Orthodox churches. And for secularists to kind of come in, um, they don't want to have, or they don't want to believe that there is a higher power mm -hmm. that is governing and that is overlooking, uh, that is not bound by the limitations of the earth, but is through it, above it, beyond it, you know, that has created all of this. And, and they don't want to have that sort of guiding them or restricting them. They want to have the free freedom to do their own thing, or to, mm -hmm. to follow their own path. Right. Um, A lot of it times it has to do with sexual immorality. Yeah. That's the main argument. Yeah. And so unfortunately, it, it, uh, it, that leads them to a, to a life of immorality, like you mentioned. Um, whereas if, if they are following the, 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 the scriptures, if they are having the scriptures as a guide, um, then there's conviction of whatever that they're doing. Um, that's not to say that as Christians, we're not being convicted or we don't have that, us too as, as Christians, um, it's just we are being guided by the scriptures, by the Holy Spirit, we've received the Holy Spirit. And so even if we are living in sin or we are sinning, um, we're being convicted. Um, and we, we, whether we listen to it or not, but it's, it's, it's inside of our, it's inside of our minds. Yeah. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, uh, most Christians will, will adhere to that, to that voice, that, that spirit that that's with, within them, that's convicting them of their actions. Whereas those that are secular, they don't want to, they want to deny right. that 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 exists and that they can just freely choose to do whatever they want to do. Yeah. And there's a couple of things. I'll, I read a book recently called, uh, it takes more faith. To, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. It's mm -hmm. a very good book. I didn't even know it was about apologetics. Apologetics yeah. is basically defending uh, a certain topic through like logical reasoning. And one of the things, two of the things is uh, how we got to this point on earth. I, I believe the big bang happened. I just believe God did the big bang. Mm -hmm. You ask an atheist or, or a Darwinist how a uh, big bang happened. They say, well, it just, it just happened. It was yeah. like, so nothing created everything. And then yeah. you ask him, what is nothing? Well, nothing is what rocks dream of. That's yeah. nothing. You're telling me that created everything. Yeah. Makes, they can't answer that question. They, they won't answer that question. Then let's fast forward and say, okay, the beginning of life. They say it started with a single cell amoeba, a single cell organism that evolved into trees, birds, animals, humans, monkeys. Okay. So you say macroevolution is a thing. Where did that single cell amoeba come from? Come from? Mm -hmm. Well, they can't answer that either. They say yeah. it was a perfect storm of chemicals in the air that somehow ended up making intelligent life. You know, the probability of that even happening is like one in one in like 100 quadrillion. I, I, I can, I can only assume, I can only imagine. Yeah. And that that's, and they say, well, if you allow it enough time for things like that to happen, it'll happen. We had 4 billion years for that to happen. It was just like, or nothing could happen for 4 billion years yeah. because how can nothing direct something? It just, it just blows my mind that people don't think that I'm, far ahead and I'm, it's depressing. One thing to, to take that and you talk to you, as soon as you mentioned gas, I thought of this, mm -hmm. you're in the semiconductor industry. I used I, to be, but yeah. used to be, I was also used to be in mm -hmm. the semiconductor and you know very well how the microchip and how such, how, how much precision goes into designing mm. the microchip and how many factors need to be aligned perfectly, um, for the microchip to come into the design of it, the process of it, and you know, the, just, just how much goes into the right. design of a microchip. And you're talking about one single microchip. Um, and now you look at it and that requires a design, uh, an intellectual design, a designer, um, somebody to create the machinery to, to all come together, to all work together. A perfect to stone, design, right. exactly. Yes, yes. And so all of that has, has a mind mm -hmm. behind it. Um, now you're looking at the, the entire world. 
those things that are visible, those things that are invisible. Mm -hmm. And how, and, and I always read this or we always hear about like how perfect the earth had to be placed away from the sun, right. and the moon with a gravitational, like if it was just slightly right, off, yeah. we would be on fire constantly or, or we, we would freezing be freezing and we would right. have no life. So yeah. all of that requires a designer, a, a designer right. uh, an intellectual complex system that has been designed, that has been put forward. And that has to be from someone that's outside Mm -hmm. of the des uh, outside of his design and who has the power to do so exactly. as well exactly. it, it's interesting because you can like let's let's stay on the topic of this and then we'll, we'll go back into our original conversation but you get all of the intelligent minds in the whole entire world with modern technology state-of-the-art technology and even throw an ai into it and mm -hmm. they still can't create a single-celled organism it's like so you're telling me with all of the intelligence in the whole entire world you as a human being can't even create you get the best scientists in the world you can't create a single-celled organism. Yeah. You can't create life. Um, well, they say, well, the Earth's conditions were perfectly back then, and it was just by random chance. Well, why hasn't it happened again now in today's time? Why hasn't nothing spawned again? Yeah. Well, they argue the climate's changed now because there's more oxygen, there's people, and now there's competing environment for resources. So there's no chances of the, and the, the climate, like the, the weather and the conditions have all changed. So there's no chances of it ever being reproduced again. Which is like, oh, okay, that's a convenient cop out to your argument. Yeah. No, I, I th again, I go back to the beginning. Glory to God. Yeah. And and thank God that we've been created with the the heart that has accepted and is trusting in mm -hmm. the fact that God is the creator of all things, visible and invisible. Yeah. yeah. So I want to go back to the antiquity question uh, about why people <clears throat> don't trust the Bible as much as other ancient documents. Mm -hmm. So I'll give an example for you, and I'll open the floor for you. Um, Alexander the Great who's a figure that we have studied since I want to say like third or fourth grade mm -hmm. and in American schools, it's been told to us as historical fact about the details of his life. But what I find very interesting is that his biography, the details of his life were not written until 400 years after he died. Mm -hmm. Yet we take all the things taught to us in school as fact. The earliest writings of the gospels were 20 to 50 years after Christ ascended into heaven. So you're saying eyewitness account 20 years after Christ has risen was written down, mm -hmm. but people deny that. But they look at Alexander the Great and they say, no, 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 this is right. You get tested on it. You get graded on answering the questions correctly. You have people write dissertations on the guy. Um, out, he was considered the greatest general of all time till this day mm -hmm. that Napoleon Bonaparte wanted to be just like him. So he modeled himself after him. He conquered Egypt just to be like Alexander the Great. Yet 400 years have passed in his life before even a single word was written down about him. Do you know how much time it takes in order for a legend um, and myth to seep in? Well, the longer gap you have in between writing down the facts, the more legends and myths will seep in into the story. Yeah. Yeah. So what is your perspective on that? Do you have any counterpoints to it? Do you have anything to add on to that? No, I think you spoke it perfectly. The one thing that I, I will say is that it's a spiritual battle that we're in. Um, and so anything to deny the existence or to deny the divinity, to deny uh, the supreme Godhead, mm -hmm. that which is in Christ, um, people will use. Um, we have gotten to a place in society, in the world, where we don't want to um, offend other people. And so we won't, um, we won't explain or we won't share the truth that is in the gospel. We will not teach the truth that is in the gospel. And, and again, we then allow people to have their own secular ideologies, their own um, basis of religion or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. And so then you sort of just drift away. There's but why so is it evidence. okay that we have to tiptoe mm -hmm. around other people's beliefs, mm -hmm. but they can't accept our truth as well? Like they, they make us mm -hmm. uh, affirm their ideas as facts, mm -hmm. the, the secularist, yeah. secularist people. But when we uh, put as Christians the truth about Jesus Christ out there into the world, yeah. they get offended by it. But we have to affirm their ideas as factual, but our facts with all the documentation in history. I mean, look at this. We have 5,000 copies of the New Testament 
from the very beginning, from when the, the, the New Testament w- was written, mm-hmm. we have 5,000 manuscripts from ancient antiquity around that time that was directly copied from it, coming from different geological regions of the world. Yeah. So, and they all, when you compare them to the same thing, they come from different years and you backtrack and you look at them, 5,000 copies all say the same thing, but one part came from the Eastern Middle East and the other part came from Asia. Yeah. And they all saying the same thing. They're cooperating with each other, yet that's not evidence enough. And then oh, I'll list one more thing. Yeah, so on. Mark actually wrote, uh, it's believed that he wrote his gospels in the 70 AD, uh, Matthew and Luke 80 AD, and John is believed to write in the 90 AD uh, time frame, which is about... 20 to 50 years after Christ ascended into heaven, mm-hmm. which leaves very little time for any type of corruption, legend, or myth to seep into yeah. his story. One thing, too, um, we have a God who we don't need to stand there and to fight his battles for him. Um, that's one thing that, that, we've, that, we've, that the early church, too, has has, has witnessed and has lived. And um, that, that's sort of where the sense of martyrdom comes from, is that, you know, we're willing to die. We're willing to sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't need to sit there and to proclaim and, 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 you know, make sure that everybody knows that, you know, he's... Because at the end of the day, if people want to believe, they'll believe. If they want to deny, they're going to deny. Mm-hmm. And, and, and there's nothing that we can do and or say that's going to change somebody. The only thing... And this is the perfect example that Christ taught us is to go out into the world and to love and to be of service to mm-hmm. others. Uh, the administrative, the, the, the love, the, the serving, the, the humble, the humility that we show in the world, that is what reflects Christ's existence in the world. Um, no matter how many manuscripts and and documents and you know the the list of evidence that Christians have mm-hmm. supporting the existence and supporting the divinity of, of Christ and it, it it probably surpasses everything that there is to debunk or to deny his existence. But it's not going to be easy to, for the world to accept it because we. Christianity itself was not made for it to be a uh, an easy walk mm. in 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 the world. We, you know, Christ came and he suffered. Christ didn't come and and was, you know, exalted and was raised on earth, but he emptied himself as the the uh, book of Philippians, the letter to Philippians says. He emptied emptied himself. He took on the image of man and everything except for sin and then he died on the cross. And if that is a telling story of what christianity is there's not there's nothing else mm-hmm. we know that as christians again you can you can tell uh the, the parish priest father Hoshaba will always say people today the wall will be white you'll tell them it's white they'll tell you, they'll tell you it's black if you paint it black they'll tell you it's white mm. and so that's that's ultimately what we have in this in this in this uh in society today yeah that's interesting i mean i did hear this one saying from uh i believe it was Stuart and cliff connectly and he said um a god that needs a human being to defend him is a weak god yeah i was like wow yeah that's it that's very powerful statement yeah god does not need us to defend him yeah he didn't send us out to defend him he didn't send us out to you know sure there was times with the crusaders and, and things like but that, that wasn't but, really defending but that wasn't defending that was the preserving existence. their life yeah and so those are different circumstances and diff- different, you know, you have to look at the historical context yeah. of those things. But we never, ha- we never have to defend God. We just have to live him and be re- the representatives of Christ in the world. And we do that by love. Mm-hmm. I think it's actually very important that we stay on the historical facts um, that, you know, we'll stay on the biblical side. But I also want to go on the historical facts of Jesus Christ as well. Because for people listening who are on the fence of believing or not, or mm-hmm. trying to pick a re- Abrahamic religion, I mean, th- the fact that Jesus Christ needs to have existed in order for th- all three of the Abrahamic religions to be accurate. And I'll explain. So the Jews, I'm, are you familiar with the Talmud or Talmud? Talmud, yeah. Yeah, okay. So it's basically um, their book of laws that they wrote between 150 AD to 500 AD. It was completed in Babylon in all places. And it's essentially a book of laws for the Jewish people to abide by that coincides with their Old Testament. Mm-hmm. And so it's a very highly regarded piece of documentation that uh, was written three to 500 years after Christ 
existed, walk the earth, uh, still exists, but you know what I mean? Mainly conservative and orthodox Jews follow the Talmud. In that document, it doesn't even deny Christ. It just tries to change your opinion of him because they couldn't lie about Christ. There was eyewitness people there. And, and, and also they saw, the Pharisees saw for themselves what Jesus did. So they couldn't explain it. So they had to say the following. They said um, in Sanhedrin 43a in the Talmud, it said uh, on the eve of Passover, Yashu was hanged for 40 days before the execution took place. A herald went forth and cried. He is going to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. So sorcery, as in his miracles, essentially he was performing. So they couldn't even deny the fact that he performed miracles. They had to just change the word to make him sound like a witch. Mm -hmm. And then uh, causing Israel to apostasy. Essentially, he did it on the, the Sabbath which was a holy day, is a holy day for the Jews. You're not supposed to do any good works on that day and nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was when Christ performed a lot of his miracles. So that's why he's saying he caused Israel to sin, basically. Uh, to finish this up, anyone who can say anything in his favor, let him come forward and plead on his behalf. But since nothing was brought forward in his favor, he was hanged on the eve of Passover. That's just one out of seven different examples. You have two Sanhedrin uh, 10.3a and Sota 47a of the Talmud. It says, Jesus practiced sorcery. Um, may his name and memory be blotted out. He incited and caused Israel to sin. So it's like, okay, in order for Judaism as a religion to even uh, be true, they need to uh, accept the fact that Jesus Christ was a real human being. Mm -hmm. In the Quran, in the Quran, it says, Surah, uh, their, their book, Surah 4, uh, colon 157, it says, and for boasting, we killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, uh, but they neither killed nor crucified him. It was only made to appear so. Even those who argue for this crucifixion are in doubt. They have no knowledge whatsoever, only making assumptions. They certainly did not kill him. So even the Quran, they say that Jesus is a Messiah. They say he's a prophet, but they don't believe he resurrected. They believe that uh, he was ascended into heaven. He never died mm -hmm. and that he'll one day come back. So for Judaism and Islam, to even be accurate, if you want to follow those religions, you need to accept the fact that Jesus Christ was a real person at the bare minimum that walked the face of the earth. Yeah. So, and if that's incorrect, then that makes the whole entire Quran and Talmud incorrect. There's nothing more to say. They, they say it in their own. The, the view that we have is that Jesus is God, is the second person of the Holy Trinity, and Jesus is the incarnate word of God. Um, he died for us, he was buried, and he rose on the third day. Mm -hmm. And that is what completes our faith. Um, that gives us the hope of salvation, that gives us the hope of eternal life, of being raised again uh, during in, in, in the second coming. Um, and we believe that Jesus uh, was born of the Virgin Mary, he performed the miracles that he did, he walked the earth as he did, um, Everything that the scriptures say about who Christ was, who Christ is, mm -hmm. is factual, is substantial, and is, is, is credible for us. So let's, let's stick with that then. Let me give you yeah. this uh, question. And I don't believe it, but hear me out. What are the chances that Jesus was a con man and he just knew the Old Testament like the back of his hand? He studied it day and night. That's why we don't know anything when he was between 12 and 30 years old, mm -hmm. nothing's documented. What if he was just studying the Old Testament like it was his job to do so? He learned exactly what the Messiah was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So he lived his life to fulfill the rules of the Messiah so that it looks like he was the Messiah. What, what are the chances that Jesus Christ was a con man? Zero, zero. Uh, you have to look at, and, and again, this is, uh, you know, for us again to defend him, it's unnecessary, but just for the sake of the, the, the podcast, those that are listening, um, prior to his birth, the events that were, you know, that, that, that took place that couldn't have happened with human manipulation, mm -hmm. uh, where he has, you know, Joseph and Mary flee, and then he's born in Bethlehem, again, as prophesied. Um, in Isaiah. Him, him, after being born, fleeing to Egypt, um, again, something that wasn't, uh, wasn't within the means of human manipulation him returning and, and living in Nazareth, again, out of human manipulation. Um, so many things that led up. Then, after all of that, 
the you look at like the self-incriminating kind of thing what would be the benefit what would be somebody that was today to do something as, as a con man or somebody that's to, today to do something that's going to manipulate others it's going to be for their benefit mm -hmm. um whereas in he had no earthly benefit um if anything he was rejected his own people denied him his own people wanted to kill him um he was constantly in those three years traveling city to city village to village and preaching the word of God, there were those people that believed him and came to him and received healing from him. And there were those that, again, wanted to kill him. Um, and it wasn't an easy lifestyle. He was uh, living among the apostles, among the disciples. Um, it wasn't an easy, easy lifestyle. Christ even says that the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Um, so it wasn't something that was like, you know, exalting or something that was, uh, you know, uh, fitting for, for a king. Yeah. Um, his entry into Jerusalem uh, on Palm Sunday, he rode in on the back of, of, of a donkey. So that could have been something that he, but even if that. And then, that's, and then ultimately all the way to his death. Um, so something, if it was to be manipulated, you mm -hmm. would do it for your own benefit uh, to raise in status, power, wealth, whatever it was. But none of those things uh, were true. But ultimately it, it led to his death his burial, his resurrection, everything that had to do with fulfilling the will of God to reconcile man with God. Um, yeah. So that was, so that, that is, is total, total. I, I don't, I don't know how people, you know, would, would believe or, or think that, you know, somebody would do something like that, um, ultimately leading to their, to their own death. Right. It's like, if you knew you were lying yeah. and they say, Hey, admit this or you're going to die. A hundred percent of people you are would. going to admit that. Yeah. But it's interesting because it, the prophecy in Isaiah, it reveals the, the manner of the Messiah's birth, which would be a virgin birth. And Micah mm -hmm. says pinpoints the place of birth, which is Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Genesis and Jeremiah it specified the ancestry of Jesus mm -hmm. or the coming Messiah. And in Matthew, in the New Testament, uh, he lists out Jesus' lineage, which matches uh, King David's line of family tree. And then in Psalms, it foretells the Messiah's betrayal, mm -hmm. his accusation by false witness, and his manner of death, which is being hung on a crucifix and uh, resurrection. Hung and being crucified was synonymous with yeah. the same word back then. So Old Testament, this is thousands to hundreds of years before Christ even walked the earth. Mm -hmm. And they're saying these things. And like you said, um, those are prophecies that no one can control. And he so happens to fulfill those specific ones. You don't control how you die. You don't control how you're born. You don't control where you're born. And so also with Mother Mary, if let's just say she was in on the con where she got pregnant. So she's just making an excuse saying she's doing it as a virgin birth. What are the chances that that son ends up becoming the leader of the yeah. biggest religion of the whole entire face of the earth? They actually did the math on this. The mathematical probability of Jesus fulfilling just eight out of the most specific messianic prophecies is one in 100 quadrillion. Wow. And it said wow, through the, scholars. The fact that they have math uh, to, to, to support. Is, yeah, is one in 100 quadrillion for him wow. to fulfill eight prophecies, the major prophecies. Yeah. Uh, it's said in the, that multiple scholars have, have uh, concluded he's fulfilled three to 400 mm -hmm. prophecies. So now take one to 100 quadrillion times. Times 50. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's mathematically impossible for him not to be yeah. God. That, I, and I think when you, I mean, I got not goosebumps, but it just, it, it puts a, a, a feeling in, mm. in, in you that like this is, this is our, our God, this is our creator, that, that he, again, he emptied himself. He, he took on this image of man and dwelt among us and has revealed so much to us. And he loves us so much that he was willing to die for us. And so it just, it kind of boggles my mind that like people would be so against or so um, directly ag against the, the existence or the belief wanting to have a relationship with him. And mm -hmm. I just, I, I don't know why or where that, I guess we know where that stems from. It comes from Satan and, and the, the evils of the world. But you did know, you ever have just, any of your own doubts? Doubts in, in what in what sense? Like doubts. Is this Christ the right or? religion? Am I doing the right things? Am I is maybe is there something else that could be possible? Uh, never doubt the religion. Um, never doubt. And and we we talk about the religion. And I want to touch on this real quick mm -hmm. if I can. Uh, we talk about religion, and there's so many people like we've heard this 
a lot, especially like today's day and age where people will say, well, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. <laughs> Um, and I, it just, it doesn't make sense. Again, to me, not, I've, I've been, I've grown up here and I've, I've, I haven't really witnessed or experienced anything outside of what the church is, but I know that the religion aspect of it is because we have, we have the texts, we have the, the worship, the liturgy, and that's what makes it a religion. But from the spiritual aspect, um, they're, they, they're intertwined. They're, you can't remove them from each other. If you are a Christian, you ought to be spiritual and religious uh, if you're doing it the right way, if you're doing it based on what Scripture and what Christ teaches you. And the, spiritual, the spirituality ought to be flourishing because the more spiritual you are, the, more, the stronger your relationship is with Christ, the more you are walking in the Spirit, you're producing fruits of the Spirit. So that, that all has to do with being spiritual. So I think people that say, oh, I'm spiritual, they ought to be producing fruits of the spirit um, mm -hmm. that we find in the book of Galatians and it's love and goodness and peace and faithfulness and having the religious and the spiritual side. Um, it's a constant walk in both of those um, growing closer to the church. And by doing so, you're growing closer to Christ um, doubts with regards to um, my, my faith or um, I, I, I don't remember or recall having doubts with regards to like the existence of Christ or, mm. um, you know, the, I was, I think, blessed and lucky enough to uh, lead a lot of our Bible studies for the youth group. And by doing so in preparing for those Bible studies, there's so much that I learn and there's so much information that I gain and so much research that I have to do. Um, and again, we just, everything that we just touched upon really stems from those mm -hmm. studying and preparations for those Bible studies. So I, 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 I can't sit there and say like, oh, I doubt it. Obviously, like when you're studying, you start asking like, how did this happen? Or where did this come from? Or, and so that just leads you to more and more research. And the more and more research you do, the more and more answers you end up finding that lead to the existence and um, the providence of God being there. So never had any doubts uh, with regards to my faith or my, you know, obviously I could always grow stronger in my faith. I can always um, uh, increase and strengthen my relationship with Christ, my walk with Christ. Um, there's times when I've, when I've fallen, I've stumbled, I've um, uh, fallen short of my expectation or, or, or really glorifying God in, in everything that I do. Um, and then there's the doubt that comes with like, you know, and, and not so much doubt, but like a self-reflection or an analyzation of what am I doing mm. uh, with regards to, you know, this serving? Um, what, why am I serving? You know, uh, I have to, everybody I think has to kind of reflect and, and look at the purpose um, behind what I'm doing, um, the, the intention of, of, of what I'm doing. And, and it had, to, had, had a lot to do with um, self-reflection with regards to the priesthood. Um, that was just a quick story on that was, you know, I had, I had to really reflect and look at like, make sure I'm doing it for the right reasons. Mm. Um, you know, I'm not doing it for the fame. I'm not doing it for the, for my own personal gain. I'm not doing it for anything that has to do with me benefiting besides me benefiting spiritually. Cause at the end of the day, you mentioned at the beginning, it's a sacrifice. Um, and I had to make sure that I'm doing it for the sole glory of God and to serve the faithful. Um, to bring souls to God. Um, my role within the youth group, um, and it, even that, like, you know, you get, you, you get put on social media. Um, the day of your concert, uh, ordination, like, there's so many people, like, hugging you and congratulating you. All those things are, like, feel-good moments. Um, but then afterwards, it's back to reality. Mm -hmm. and you, have a, you have a responsibility to fulfill. And like I mentioned earlier, you're always a priest. And the, the weight or the burden, um, and not so much in like a bad way, but the weight and burden that comes with it, the responsibility, um, it's always with you. And so you, you always have to reflect and, and sort of look at your intentions and hey, make sure like your, your heart is on the right path and you're gratifying, you're, gra you have, you're showing gratitude to God, you're thankful for God. Um, and, and God is guiding you, the Holy Spirit is guiding you to make sure that you know, you're doing this for the right reasons at all times, um, serving with pure intentions, with all you, all you can. Because as, as, a, as a priest, as a man, I'm, I have my own weaknesses. I'm frail in my own journey. 
and I need Christ to strengthen me. And so those moments, and, 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 I'm, and I'm reassured, and I'm, I, I get the confidence of Christ's presence when there is something that is too tall for me to, to manage. And just, I think, priesthood in itself is just such a tall task mm. um, that God has, has given us the blessing and the ability to, to be priests is just an un, unimaginable like gift and that itself being able to administer being able to serve on the altar um hold the body and blood of christ those are are what give me the confidence that no this is this is christ strengthening me this is this is the presence of christ and in those moments my faith is at at an all-time high my relationship is at an all-time high and all i want to do in those moments is make sure that people see and they glorify God. Mm. You know, I don't want them to look at Andrew and say, oh, no, gosh, Andrew's doing an amazing job. No, they need to look at me. And if I'm doing it the right way and the way that God intends for me, then people will look at me and they'll go back and glorify God. And they'll be able to walk in the spirit based on how I'm living my life and, and spreading that. So being an example to the community. Yes. Got it. How can we prove the disciples were not being biased? when they wrote the Gospels? Okay, very good question. Um, again, it goes back to even Christ, the question of Christ and, and what he was doing and ultimately leading to his death. Mm -hmm. The disciples uh, not being biased also had, they had gotten, they have, they received no personal gain. Um, they too were rejected. They too were kicked out of the, the community. They mm -hmm. too, um, face death. They were all martyred, except for John, who was almost martyred. Then he, he was exiled. On he island. was exiled. Um, Why, how do we know they were martyred? Is there written documentation? There's written document. There there's there's mm -hmm. manuscripts. There's um, there's early church again. The the traditions and the, the early church writings that you know you date back to the first first century that records um, how they were martyred, where they were martyred in brutal ways. And in oh yeah. Oh, yeah. so I, one of them was sawed in half they while were, he was alive. Yeah. One of them was had his skin ripped off of his body and mm -hmm. then boiled and then beheaded. Boiled. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, crucified, crucified upside up, down. Yeah. That was St. Peter. Yeah. And then his, his brother was crucified on the X yes. cr cross. Was, Andrew, was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, being mauled by, by animals mm -hmm. and things like that. So Vicious. Um, all of those things. And then again, we go back to the, the, the historical, the archaeological, um, the fact that you know they were eyewitnesses to Christ and and everything that they that they wrote that they said, um, it wasn't for anything personal. Mm. And then the last thing was that if they were being biased, they wouldn't include some of the negative things that happened. Um, Thomas doubting, they mm. wouldn't include that moment. Um, Peter denying Christ, they wouldn't include certain certain, certain um, things like that. Where it's it would just so, showed a perfect picture. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But but we read about, you know, their their lack of understanding some of Christ's parables and his teachings. They made them look very stupid, by the way. So in, the, the in, disciples looked like they were in, missing very obvious in, lessons sometimes. In a in a in a in a certain way, and, and again with the 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 divine and the divinely inspired, uh, it led to Christ explaining the parable yeah. step by step. Right. So that we can understand it. And yes. and there was there were the scribes and the pharisees that weren't understanding as well and, and the disciples ask why do you speak in parables and he even explains why he spoke in parables and so um for the disciples to be biased with regards to what they wrote about christ or anything again it led to their it led to their martyrdom and yeah. it led to their death and so um there's no there's no there's no reason for them to be biased they wrote the the accurate eyewitness account of what they heard what they saw and they documented it and they put it in canon for it was canonized by the church yeah. for, for us to to use. Again, like I said, apostolic tradition and the truth is all in the scriptures. Have you ever met one of your like childhood heroes before? Have I met a childhood hero? No. I have. And it kind of sucks. Who? Uh, Blake Griffin. Oh, okay. I met Blake Griffin twice. Okay. And he gave me two autographs. But the first time I met him, I was like 16 years old. So this is like eight, nine years ago. Uh -huh. And um, I remember I was the biggest Clippers fan in the world. And when I met Blake, I was sh I was shaking. I was like, Blake, you're the reason why I started playing basketball. And he was like, oh, yeah, man, thanks. I appreciate it, bro. He just signed my basketball and he walks away. And I was like, 
all right, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna get too upset because I was like, he probably hears that all the time. Yeah. But there was a side of me that was just like, man, like I understand now, like don't meet your heroes because it's gonna be disappointment. Maybe they're not gonna care, whatever. If the disciples, mm -hmm. their hero was Christ, is Christ. Mm -hmm. And if they found out that Christ was a fraud and they were just being biased and writing things in his favor, yeah. their world would have been shattered. That if they gave up everything to follow someone who wasn't really who he said he was, they found out, they would have left. They wouldn't have continued their mission. They wouldn't have died for someone mm -hmm. knowingly, kn knowing that he's not who he says that he actually was. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's uh, when, when Christ is giving the bread of life discourse in John chapter six, mm -hmm. some, of the, some of his followers do leave. Some of them can't fathom the, when, when Christ says, uh, unless you eat the body and drink the blood of, the son of man, you have no life in you. Um, and so then a group of them leave. And then Christ turns to his disciples and says, do you also want to go with them? Do you want to leave as well? And, and Peter responds and says that you have the words of everlasting life. Where else would we go? Mm. So there was a group, there was a, a, a faction of people that couldn't fathom, they couldn't take, they couldn't, uh, what Christ was saying was too much for them to, to to bear and and that bread of life discourse um the obviously it was against mosaic law to partake in cannibalism so they they didn't understand uh what christ was speaking when he said that this is my body this oh, is oh i see and so when he's giving the bread of life discourse they're looking at him like this is insanity right it's not until the last supper when he takes the bread and blesses it and breaks it and takes the cup and blesses it and gives it to the disciples and says, this is my body, this is my blood. Then those that were there remember that this is the bread of life. They remember the bread of life discourse. They remember what he was preaching and they connect the two. That when he said, unless you eat the body and drink the blood, this is, you have no life in you. And so this is what he's saying. That it, mm. This is the body and blood that he was referring to. So what I want to just say is that there were, there were disciples, there were people that were following Christ that it got too much for them to understand. It got too much for them to fathom. They did leave. Whereas these disciples that stayed, you know, they, they fully trusted and they had moments of doubt. They still didn't understand that this Messiah isn't going to overtake the Roman empire and, and, and give it back to the Israelites. Um, they couldn't understand that, you know, every time he'd say, I'm, we're going to go to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered and will die. They were, they were sort of confused. They weren't mm -hmm. understanding. And so the, the perspective that they had, all the disciples, by the way, they leave Christ when he's captured mm -hmm. on they, the cross. They're scared. It's just John. Yep. Um, the, the other, the rest of them go in hiding. Um, you mentioned about doubting Thomas. It's not until they receive the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost when everything then gets fulfilled. Everything gets, um, it, it, it culminates the, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth that's given to them just encapsulates everything. It reminds them of everything. It empowers them. It strengthens them. And that is what empowers them to write. That is what empowers them to travel the world, um, to cure to perform all of the miracles that Christ was performing, they, were, they began performing. That which Christ gave them and said, um, what you loose on earth and what you bound on earth will be bound and loosed in heaven. Mm. It was through that Holy Spirit that they ultimately received. And the Holy Spirit, like we mentioned at the beginning, is what has remained. And that power that comes from the Holy Spirit, that's God himself. And so that was what the disciples were, were living through that is what the the authority we say the, the the authority of the holy spirit the the dispensation of the holy spirit with through the church has allowed um the disciples and the apostles and then the early church fathers and today that's how we that's how we grow that's how we continue to to celebrate and to um function as as a church yeah the first time when i read the the gospels i actually just finished the new testament very recently um last week last sunday okay that was the first time i went i saw the, your yeah, yeah i yeah. saw your social media very post. happy about that I was, I was like dang i actually read the whole new testament yeah wasn't as hard as i thought it would be and um it only took me a while because i, I would mainly read on sundays at church mm -hmm. but 
when I was going through the gospels, what I noticed was that they were basically saying the same story, mm -hmm. just different perspectives. And I, I was getting annoyed. I was like, man, I already read this. Like, why am I rereading it again? And then I realized, I was like, oh, they included all four of these in here because they're telling the same story from different perspectives. That actually adds legitimacy to the overall story of Christ. That's yeah. why they did that. And then the, the synoptics, the, the first three, uh, which is uh, Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, uh, Matthew, Luke, and Mark, um, John is considered its own thing because that goes into the divinity of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, those first three, you know, they say, well, if they were accurate, they would be basically saying the same exact thing. Well, it's like, well, no, that would actually discredit their credibility because they're writing from their own perspectives. If they say the same exact thing, then they're not writing from their own perspective. That, that, that shows that they cooperated with each other to make up a fake version of the story. Yeah. So the fact that there is differences yeah. is uh, what you have to be looking out for in those synoptics. Yeah, why, why, why die for something that you knew was a lie when it was even written by your own hands? Mm -hmm. you know, if, you, if you wrote it down that this is a lie, then why, why die for it? Yeah. Christianity, let's say they somehow got it all the way through to the point where Jesus was crucified and they were like, all right, they're, they're still going on with the con. How can it have taken place in root of Jerusalem where everyone knew who the disciples were? Uh, they knew who Jesus was. At that point, he was famous. The whole Everyone knew Jesus of Nazareth mm -hmm. at that point. Uh, he had the Sermon on the Mount, all these things. So if the stories were uh, flowing through the cities, let's say, and his ops, the, the people that wanted to discredit Jesus, the Pharisees, the people who crucified Jesus, if they heard uh, these false narratives, the, the, the biases of the disciples going out in the cities, they would have been more than happy to correct uh, all of the false claims that the disciples were making because they wanted to, to shut up the religion as soon as quickly as possible. The fact that it took root in Jerusalem and it nourished there and it started there and then it flourished out the rest of the world. It has to show you that there was no one there that could refute what happened because if they did, there would be more uh, funded books on the projects. There would have been more outspoken individuals that would have thought it had been worth their time, but because they knew that it wasn't worth their time, they never did. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really interesting as well. One of the, um, in the book of Acts, um, the disciples are preaching and the faith is growing and there's a lot of uh, the people that are listening and hearing the gospel and they're being baptized and they're coming to the faith. And uh, the, the scribes and some of the Pharisees, they take the disciples, again, to, to harm them, to tell them to stop preaching Jesus Christ. And they send them outside and then they say, they start discussing within themselves, the Pharisees. And one of the Pharisees goes, if this is from man, we shouldn't touch it. If it's from man, let it just go. It's going to dissolve on its own. And he brings up two other instances, two other men who sort of got a following they performed some things, they taught some things, and then they had a following of people. As soon as their leader died, those people just dispersed and that, that little uprising that they had created went away, dissolved. Mm. He mentions the second person, he says the same thing. Like if it's, if it's somebody that just a man is doing this, it, eventually that person will die and those that have followed him are gonna go away. They're gonna dissolve, nothing's gonna happen. But he says, if it's from God, no matter what we do, as much as we harm these people, if it's God's doing, we can do nothing to stop the growth and the, the increase of this. Hmm. So he says, let's just leave them alone. So they bring them back, they, they whip them some more, and they send them off. And, and ultimately we see that it's, it's from God. And it's this, still here. This, is, this is, you know, what, what, the, what the, them themselves, like you mentioned earlier with the, the Talmud, it's the same thing. It's the Pharisees themselves saying, hey, look, if it's from God, we can't do anything about it. Uh, we just beat these guys up a little bit and then send them off their way. But if it's if it's for man, just let it go. And obviously, you know, we see where we are today with with Christianity. And so it's just from God. Isn't it interesting that the Jews wrote the Old Testament yet and and they know the prophecies like yeah. the back of their hand. Yeah. Yeah. When they see someone match the profile, the fingerprint of God <laughs> perfectly into mm -hmm. what the Old Testament is saying, they still can't admit that Jesus Christ was. The Messiah, they say that he was a uh, conman. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, even the, the Israelites in the Old Testament, um, they had their moments. Uh, they were the chosen people of God. But even them, you see how 
you know, they had this, this condition, they had this, uh, ungrateful, this un ungratefulness, this, this consistent attitude where, you know, they would plead with God and mm. they would want something for themselves to be out of, you know, the Pharisee, out of the Pharaoh, um, out of Egypt. Then they're in the, 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 the promised land and they begin can they are they, they're in the wilderness and they begin complaining again against Moses and against God mm -hmm. and then they get into the promised land and then they begin complaining against against the the prophets and, and against the king and against God and you know they they're constantly yearning for more they want more for themselves they want more from their own perspective from their own security for their own and without trusting in God and so the ultimately it's it's this condition that yes these were the chosen people of God, but they have a condition. They have a heart problem where they're constantly not trusting in God. Mm -hmm. um, they're constantly going against their prophets. They're constantly going against what the prophets are teaching on behalf of God. And it's ultimately leading to their own destruction. They're being overtaken by their neighboring um, empires. Mm -hmm. They're being destroyed. But God shows them that as small as they are, as, as you know, less as they are, when they trust in God and they trust in, in their prophets, no matter how big the enemy was, no matter how great the enemy was, they were able to overcome. Yeah. And so it's the same when, when then we have Christ. And again, you go back and it's that same condition where they want their own security. They want their own kingdom. They want their own power. Mm -hmm. um, and they're unwilling to receive the blessing that would have came had they had trusted in, in Christ. And so everything happens for a reason, and this is the providence of, of, of God. And, and Christ, the week of uh, the, the passion, um, goes up and says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I wanted to gather you as a chicken gathers her, her hen, or as a hen gathers her chicks, and you just, you constantly refused. Mm. And, and then that's leading, that's opening the way to, to the Gentiles that, that came uh, yearning for, for the kingdom because of, you know, they, they saw Christ and they saw everything that he was doing and they, they continued. They, they are the ones that believe they entered the kingdom before the Israelites, the chosen people. So Why didn't Jesus straight up say, I'm God? Um, well, there's two, th there's a few instances where, where he did. Um, just, again, uh, I think there's been a lot of, um, I've seen this on social media a couple of times, uh, Cliff, Cliff, I've, I've seen mm -hmm. Cliff uh, as an apologetic mention this as well. Um, in John chapter eight, uh, he he says, "Before Abraham was, oh, I yeah. am." Um, and this is going back to the book of Exodus and God telling Moses. He says, "Who should I set? Who should I tell? Or what should I tell?" Um, who sent me? Who sent me? You say, "I am." I am who mm -hmm. I am. God said. Um, so then in, in the New Testament, Christ says, before Abraham was, I am. Mm -hmm. And they pick up stones and they want to they, they want to uh, they want to stone him for, for blasphemy. Right. Um, the argument is that they would have killed him, though, for blaspheming on the spot. Yeah. So why didn't they kill him on the spot? Then why didn't they stone Jesus for saying I am? Well, it says it says that he he left and there was this divine um, ability to get out of the the death sentence or that that moment. Mm. Um, where, where, where they were trying to stone him. There's other times when he forgives sin. He says, your sins have been forgiven. And they, said, they, they say that only, only God can, can forgive sin. Who is this that, that mm -hmm. is forgiving sin? Um, so in those, in those senses, um, and you see the sort of uprising that happens when he claims, when makes, when makes the divine claim of being God or being right. the son of God. Um, and so if that were to happen ultimately, at the beginning or you know there would have been so much opposition or the approach of coming to christ and 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 killing him or, or uh taking him and, and doing you know crucifying him or whatever the manner was of, of death um it would have happened sooner and so the the entire approach had to do with his approach and his revelation to everybody um to the pharisees the scribes the nation of israel everybody that came from um you know all all the nations around mm -hmm. and also to his own disciples um we see in the baptism when the skies open and the dove descends and the voice of god saying this is my beloved son in whom i will please obey him um saint john the baptist you know says behold the lamb of god um there's so many instances where we see uh 
different takes and different approaches. Um, the trans- Son of Man reference from the book of, what was it, Book of David? Yeah, the, the, the Psalms. Uh, you see Christ transfigured on the mountain, um, Elijah and Moses mm-hmm. uh, being there. And, and all of these are revelations of his divinity. Um, and, and without really speaking, but it's a revelation. And, and so that's, those are all instances where we see the divinity yeah. um, raising uh, people from the dead. Mm-hmm. Um, those, are, those are all things that we have to look at and say, this is, this is God. This isn't um, just a prophet. This isn't just, uh, just a, 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 re- a renowned teacher. But this is God. So Yeah. Well, I mean, the way that I look at it is the following. It's like you can start an LLC. You can call yourself a CEO. You can hire one person. Are you really a CEO? Mm-hmm. Are you, until other people start calling you that thing, you're not really the CEO of that business. It was like the episode of The Sopranos where he was, um, I forgot who it was, but someone came in and kept saying that, I'm the boss, I'm the boss, I'm the boss. And then someone pulled him aside and said, hey man, if you keep saying that you're the boss, you're, you're not. not really the boss. Yeah. So like, I'm not saying anyone can just come out and start saying that they're God. But what I am saying is, is that if God was really on earth, he didn't have to go out and keep telling everybody who yeah. he's God. Because then at that point, it's like, are you really God if you keep telling everybody? Yeah. Or how about you just show us what God's capable of doing, such as, uh, well, you can't see someone forgive sin. That is an invisible, you know, thing that happens within the realm of, you know, God's existence. But we can see miracles. Mm-hmm. We can see walking on water. We can see all of these things that are un- unexplainable yeah. uh, happening. And that's why Christ was building credibility, um, performing those miracles before at you know the end of the Gospels where he says, I am. Yeah. So he was just building up credibility the whole entire time. And that, that makes perfect sense to me. At, at some point, if people don't want to just accept um, what's clearly presented in front of them, then it's no longer uh, a lack of evidence. Mm-hmm. It's more so of a refusal in terms of either pride, ego, wi- uh, unwillingness to accept what's yeah. there kind of thing. Yeah. And that was something that I had to just like accept. Like people are like, oh, okay, some people, no matter what you show them, like how we talked about earlier on, they're just not going to accept it. Yeah. Which, by the way, doesn't only pertain to religion or Christ. Right? Anything. It's just everything in this Anything. world. I think there's right. a lot of people that you can show them this is the facts, this is the evidence, and they'll still have their own yeah. uh, mindset. Politics but, uh, included. Christ, Christ himself is, is worshipped in, in scriptures. Um, uh, it says that they came and they worshipped him. Um, he, you know, just at, at birth, um, when the wise men came and they brought the gifts, and those gifts that they gave, gave him had to do with his death, mm-hmm. with him being a king, mm-hmm. and with him being the priest, um, the high priest. So all those you know, small but very intricate details ultimately, you know, point to Christ's divinity and, and him being uh, him being God as well. When, when the disciples, uh, when Thomas saw him post-resurrection, uh, calls him my Lord and my God. Um, so those things, uh, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't, like you said, doesn't need Christ to stand there in the scriptures and say, I am God. Right. Um, but that's that's what that's where we get to. Yeah, I mean, also one last thing we can move on. Um, it's mm-hmm. the sign above his head when he was being crucified. It said Inri, which is Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. Mm-hmm. Is what it translates to. Mm-hmm. It's like okay, King of the Jews. At some point, you know, he either said that he was God to somebody, or people were claiming it and he wasn't denying yeah. it. Um, some people have argued that uh, being King of the Jews is a reference to the Messiah was going to be the person who frees the Jewish people from Roman captivity because the Jewish people at that time were uh, oppressed by Roman authority. They were second-class citizens. They lived in the ghettos. The Romans treated them like trash. And so their prophecies were saying that one day a Messiah is going to come and free us from the Romans. So a lot of secularists and deniers of Christ say they were referring to Jesus as this like general figure that was going to lead the march of the Jewish people uh, in terms of like army uh, mm-hmm. and military references to to the promised land, essentially yeah. away from Roman capital. That's why they put a crown on his head when they crucified him. That's why they called him King of the Jews. But it's yeah. just like, well, theirs theirs was more of like a mockery, um, right? But there was a I forget who it was. It was recent. Uh, I was watching a sermon by a Catholic bishop, mm-hmm. and he said that indirectly, 
when Pontius Pilate writes King of the Jews and puts it above Christ, he indirectly is confessing that this is the King of the Jews. And oh, was, Pontius Pilate wrote it. Yeah, I didn't well, even know well the, by, the, by the declaration or by the, uh, the command of them to put uh, that up there. Okay. So whether okay. it was the Roman soldiers or... But they put it on there mm -hmm. and it was approved and you know that was there it was more of a mockery the same thing with the thorn uh the crown of thorns it right. was a mockery but all of these um you know are indicating and show what kind of kingdom he was really uh, one of self-sacrifice one of one of love one of of service um and it wasn't like a kingdom the israelites were waiting for a, a king to come and overtake and, and, and a sort of a second David to, to unite the kingdom, to uprise um, above the Romans, to overtake the Roman Empire and to give them that freedom and sovereignty back. But, but that wasn't the kingdom that Christ came mm -hmm. for. Uh, that, that kingdom here on earth is, is temporary, um, no matter how great of an empire, and you know very well, empires that have amassed such large and, and wealthy nations that end up falling. Us. Uh, for, yeah, for, for many for many reasons, for many fa different factors. But there's always a cycle of, of different mm -hmm. empires and different nations. But that kingdom that is eternal, that is in heaven, that, is the, the, that, that required the self-sacrifice. That required the, 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 the king of kings to come down. And in the, in the manner of which he, he died, he accepted and, and he showed us the, the way of entering into that kingdom so if he was supposed to be the person the messiah that was setting the jewish the jews free like wouldn't it have said like king of the world king that over the the destroy the roman empire something that had to be more specific you well know again I mean? it goes back to like how how they were very um i don't want to say like racist but they were prejudiced right yeah. so they they had this prejudice against everybody else right um, they were they were the chosen people they were the jews um they couldn't Enter Mary. They were they were to themselves, um, and and then that's where Christ sort of comes in and breaks that barrier. Mm -hmm. and now, spiritually speaking, there is no Jew, nor Greek, nor slave, nor free, nor you know everyone is one in Christ. There's right. spiritual equality um, when when we have faith in Christ. So that was that that barrier was broken. It took some time for mm -hmm. it to break, but uh, that prejudice was was what so they wanted their own king somebody to rule for them um, so that they can be the chosen people and live in a country in a land that was promised to them from old that was dedicated to them where nobody else can enter yeah. it was just for them so that's why it was an interesting question that people used to bring up back in the day they would uh, used to ask us within the assyrian community would you would you rather be um what would you be first, a Syrian first or Christian first? Uh -huh. That was a question that people used to ask all the time. And I would say it's a no-brainer. It's Christian first because if you're lucky, you got 80 years max, max on this earth um, of you being a Syrian. Great. But as soon as you die, I'm a proud Assyrian. Let that be known. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you die, your body goes back to the dust in which it came from. But your soul lives for eternity with Christ. And he doesn't care, like how you were just saying, yeah. about what ethnicity you were. That was just a way for us to profile each other, to figure out who's in whose tribe, who's the enemy, who, who can you uh, not be wary of when they're coming by with uh, torches and sticks at night. You yeah. know, like that's just a way of distinguishing for survival reasons. And now it is what it is today as ethnicities. Um, but Christ doesn't care about that. So I would always say Christian before Assyrian, no problem. Does Christianity promote slavery? Does not promote it. Um, if this is a complex thing, it's, a, it's more of a yes or no question. It, it doesn't promote it, no. Um, but, and I know this is from scripture and, and the, the talk about um, uh, sort of by speaking of how slaves should treat their masters and how masters should treat their slaves, we're almost compromising or justifying. Uh, but it's a, it's a historical and it's a complex sort of view of, of it. Um, if you look in the Old Testament, um, there were... Uh, regulations and sort of instructions on how to treat humanely and with grace and kindness and not mistreat slaves um, and even indentured servants that were part of the part of your nation and then foreigners that were captured as as slaves um, there were certain regulations on how to how to treat them um, and even it came to a time where um, depending on how many years they served and what the, what the circumstance was, that they were to be released. Um, then we go into the New Testament, and, and, and St. Paul mentions how 
masters, <clears throat> excuse me, masters should treat their slaves um, with dignity, with love, with care, with righteousness, with respect, um, and slaves to, to obey and to work for your master as you're working for the Lord. Um, and again, it's not so much as like promoting slavery, but that was the, the, the landscape of the time when, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a concept of like changing slavery right. for it to not, it was just how it always was. And so, um, a lot of scholars and a lot of theologians and church, church fathers sort of show and say that the undermining theme of love and compassion and mercy and all these undermine the justification of slavery mm. in, in the in the scriptures so um obviously what we see today and and our view of slavery um based on more recent history with uh, the african americans in america and how they were mistreated and how um they were viewed as, as you know three-fourths of a person or you know those those are the images we get of slavery and uh and then we look at um, again, unfortunately, a lot of the the slave owners um, were Christian, and um, they justified their owning of slaves based on scripture. And, but it's it's mm. definitely doesn't it's not something that we can look at the scriptures and say, oh well, this is you know this teaches that we can have slaves. So this, yeah. So that that mentality is is is, is flawed. Um, well, I think it's also the, important to know, I'm sorry to cut you yeah. off, that the slavery of the New World America and slavery mm -hmm. of back then was different for one particular reason. Slavery in the New Testament time was not indicative of uh, race. Mm -hmm. It was just whoever was captured or owed a debt yes. or uh, they owe you something of some kind, you became a slave to them. Yeah. And even Paul writes to, I believe it was the book of Philemon, where he, yes. he tells the slave owner, he says, uh, treat your slave with kindness as a yeah. brother and forgive him of his debt. And he's like, if you don't, I'll pay for his debt. Yes. And that's like one of the major vocal contributing forces to the spread of Christianity. Paul is saying that he will pay personally to free the slave himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, it's not so much, like you said, it's, it's, it's night and day between the, the new world slavery versus yeah. what was um, in, in scripture, the historical context. So mm -hmm. you look at Rome, uh, you know, they had slaves. And again, it was based on the foreigners that they, that they captured in war or battle or anything like that. And then it was more of a, of a service that, you know, it was the debt that was being repaid. Um, there's even the story of, of, of Christ, um, giving a parable with regards to forgiveness, mm. uh, and the, the man that goes to the King and owes a larger debt. He's forgiven. Um, the, the King forgives him of his debt, but he goes out and he finds someone that owes him a lesser debt, beats him, throws him in prison. And once he's find out that, you know, for a lesser debt than he was forgiven, he, you know, threw this man in prison, the king calls him back and says, you will be uh, thrown in prison until you know, the last penny is paid because you didn't have mercy on this person. So, so the, these, these concepts, these, these, uh, these characteristics that are being taught to us, these themes of, of mercy and compassion and love really sort of undermine this, this ideology of like there was slavery. So, yeah, well, it's the, the question arises, like, why didn't Jesus come and free all of the slaves then, mm -hmm. you know, but like, it, it's not that Jesus wanted people to literally be like in, in shackles and chains. It's just, he, he didn't come to disassemble the kingdoms that we yeah. know and understand here. He came to spread the glory and, and his message and to change our hearts yeah it wasn't to come and rip chains and break into boxes and take people out of the prisons that they were in and take them to a better place it was change the hearts of man and then when you change their hearts the concepts of slavery changes itself as well i mean look what happened to america our hearts all changed within the time period of the 1800s mm -hmm. where now we all viewed it as a moral you know, iniquity, yeah. a, a disgusting thing that it should be rejected. Absolutely. And, you know, you could attribute that to Christian countries being the first to do that, because if you look in the Middle East, it's still happening till this day. Yeah. Slavery is more big now than it was in the 1800s. And uh, this is a Christian nation in America. We got rid of it in the 1800s, but in the other parts of the world, it's not. They're not Christian nations. Yeah. So you could say that Christ changed our hearts and then that slowly changed the way that we viewed these types of behaviors of the people of the back then. 
Um, I want to play a game with you. Okay. I got a card game. All right. This fly is annoying. Uh, it's mm -hmm. called the Lazy Intellectual Card Game. Very original, but I don't have a name for it right now. Basically, uh, I'm going to shuffle these cards. It's got a bunch of questions on it that I typically wouldn't ask a person during an interview. Um, they're more intimate questions that you could ask of like a person you're trying to get to know more like on a personal basis or maybe even if you want to like take it on a date with you, you could. Um, and so I would like it if you could please pick a card, answer the card truthfully. And then when you're done, give me a question. I'm going to then make your own card called the Father Andrew Aziz card and it's going to live forever in the game. Okay. You might have to explain the second part, but sure. Let me uh, let me just pick a card. This is totally random. This is a good one. What is the biggest misconception people have about you? Mm. Um, there's two that are on my mind, but I, I want to answer this one. I think the biggest misconception. I've heard people say this directly to me, and I've heard people say this like non not to me, but like through my friends and things. Um, it's that I am too intimidating like they're i'm an intimidating person to mm. approach or to discuss things with or just have like a conversation um and i don't know if that is um it's totally false uh i am not intimidating at all i think those people that do know me uh know i think how easily approachable i am mm -hmm. or i think i want to be um so it's definitely a misconception um that is about me so i, I hope uh people that are listening are not intimidated anymore and they can come and talk to me so and then uh do you have anything on your mind for a question like as of the game it would be what is your biggest regret in life mm. i don't know if that's one that you already have on there or not but i can't remember we got 39 36 cards okay um i gotta look through it and if it is i'll i know i know where you work i'll, yeah. I'll find you for that <laughs> question <laughs> all right um so why did jesus have to suffer such a painful death um, so with regards to Christ's death, um, and the, the way it happened, you have to look into the old Testament, um, and you have to look in a ancient or near East, um, ideology as mm -hmm. well. Um, number one, we look at, uh, the sacrifice of animal sacrifice, um, and the offering on the altar, uh, the shedding of blood. Um, St. Paul says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, no forgiveness of sin. Um, but if you look in the, in the scriptures, and even if you look outside of the scriptures, in the, the traditions of the Near East, you had, um, you had two groups when they were making a covenant or a pact with each other. Mm -hmm. You had a, what was called a, um, like a, a greater um, greater nation or a larger nation or a greater empire army whatever it was and then you had a smaller one um, that was dependent on the larger so what would happen would be for example let's say the assyrian empire being a large empire strong empire they would have a smaller nation or a smaller tribe or whatever um be a uh, be a, 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 a vassal for mm. them what would happen would be the larger that is uh, protecting they would come and they would make a pact with the smaller and the smaller would make this pact with them and what would ultimately be the conditions of this covenant or this pact would be that as the larger nation you as a smaller nation are dependent on the larger but when the larger goes to war they will require you to help send send resources you will provide them resources whenever they need in return, they will protect you, they will bless you, they will... But if you break this covenant, if you break this pact, if we go to war and you don't send military help, if we go to war and you don't provide resources that you are supposed to provide us with, then we will slaughter you. We will come back and we will destroy that, small, uh, that smaller nation. Mm -hmm. And how they would sign this deal um, would be that they would have a feast and in this feast, they would take these animals and they would slaughter them. And prior to them cooking them and partaking in this feast, the smaller group would walk through these slain animals, signifying that if we break this covenant, we will be slaughtered as these animals are. So now take it into <clears throat> the, the Old Testament. And there's a part in the book of Genesis where God and Abraham make a pact, make a covenant. And 
God commands Abraham to bring animals and kill them and lay them. He lays them, and then it says that God puts Abraham into a deep sleep. And then it says that a light goes through these, this, this sort of path of animals that have been slain, mm -hmm. signifying that God being the greater and Abraham and the nation of Israel being the smaller, he is dependent on God. <clears throat> they, make the, they, they made the covenant, God made the covenant with, with mankind. But God, in this case, was the one that walked through the animals that were slain on, on the floor. And so when humanity broke the covenant with God, when humanity went away from God and sinned and disobeyed against God, God sent his only begotten because the amount of sacrifices that were being done on the altar were never enough as the as St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews mentions that it was never enough to 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 absolve sin once and for all. Mm -hmm. It was not a perfect sacrifice, but Christ who came from above and offered himself as the perfect sacrifice, he was the one who was slain on behalf of the the entire world who broke that covenant with God. And so the the necessity of a sacrifice was there because since the Old Testament, since the creation of time, man knew altar and they knew this sacrifice that God would accept a well, a, a pleasing sacrifice, um, one that was of an animal, one that was that had shed blood. And so as much as there was the shedding of blood of animals, the person that was shedding the blood of those animals, he himself needed salvation. He himself needed absolving. Mm. But when Christ comes, who is perfect, who is without sin, he comes and he is the sacrifice and he is the one offering the sacrifice. Mm. And so by that happening, he is the perfect sacrifice. And that's why, and, and then you look into the story of the Exodus where the blood of the lamb saves the nation of Israel from the angel of death and they're, they're led out of Egypt um, Christ becomes the Passover lamb. John the Baptist points at him and says, behold, the lamb of God. So he is the one who is slain. And then we, we discussed earlier with regards to all of the prophecies having to do with the, in, the way in which he was murdered and the way he was beaten and, and crucified um, and enduring the suffering for, for our behalf. So that was, that's that, that, that mentality, that's the view with regards to the, the, the necessity. Because a lot of people will ask like, how or why did Christ die the way he did? Couldn't he have died in a, in a different way? Mm -hmm. Why was he transgressed? Why was he, or why was he pierced for our transgressions? What was the point of it? Why was he slaughtered yeah. like a lamb? So those things, uh, with, I mean, besides the, the prophecy, but that, that mentality of, of a covenant relationship between God and man, um, they knew it, they understood it because it was something that was, was relevant in the Near East. It was something that even outside of Scripture, the you know the, the 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 empires and the tribes of the Middle East would would practice this um, this covenant relationship that they had there. Yeah, I mean, even if you think about it logically, the more, the thing that human beings do their whole entire lives is survival. Mm -hmm. We're designed to survive. Yeah. So the one thing that we are intimately afraid of is the vast unknownness of what death brings. Mm -hmm. We don't know what happens at the end of it. We think we do, but still, like it is a scary thought, and so. The, uh, there's an amazing quote in the book by Lee Strobel. He says, the most human thing a human can do is die. And so Christ dying on our behalf is like the most loving action a person can do because mm -hmm. it's the most humane thing possible, which is to die, do the thing that we are avoiding our whole entire lives, which is death. Mm -hmm. And he's doing it for us and our salvations. And yeah. he's doing it in the most brutal way and uh humiliating way which is publicly displayed you know like i was thinking of like an age-appropriate analogy for what crucifixion was it's like imagine going to elementary school and you get your pants pulled down in front of all the kids it's like now you think you're gonna have a whole bunch of friends after getting pants or you think you're gonna be the laughing stock after having had been pants in front of everybody it's like no you would be the laughing stock everyone would make fun of you they would know yeah. what your underwear looks like but then christ he had the most humiliating form of death yet the world's biggest religion formed around him and he was able to 
then fulfill more prophecies, come back. And he happened to be the only one person that out of hundreds or thousands that the Romans have crucified that not only said to fulfill the prophecies, performed miracles and signs, couldn't have been doubted by his um, uh, oppositions, yet was crucified, and he was the only one that had a religious movement around him. Just, it's interesting. Glory to his name. How could a loving father mm. punish his son forever? So the way that this translates to Christian terms is, mm -hmm. How could God create a hell to condemn billions of souls in when he was the one who created each of the souls? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if we to look at the story of the prodigal son, okay. Did God, did the father, uh, did the father create this living situation for his son that left? Or was the son's own decisions creating that situation for him, the environment? And that's ultimately in the, simplest terms, how we view our relationship with God and how um, we are given the freedom to make those decisions that lead to our own demise. Hell or the, the existence is, is being away from God. And we know that the, the second coming um, when we're divided or we're, we're, just, you know, we're distributed mm -hmm. between uh, taken, being taken up into uh, the presence of God and living there eternally in the kingdom of heaven versus remaining here on earth, where here on earth will be a weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, it's not so much that God creates it for us and, and puts it there for us, um, but rather it's the free will of humanity that chooses to be away from God, that chooses not to be in the presence of God, mm. and then eternally were given that eternally with God is is unimaginable. This joy, this bliss, this this grace, this love, this uh, this this an unimaginable you know emotion, um, and this being in the presence of God. Everything that was hidden or mysterious in the past has been revealed. We have a glimpse of it here in the here on earth via the church. And then it'll be revealed in its fullness in its entirety. And mm -hmm. St. Paul says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard the, the greatness that has been prepared for us in the kingdom. Um, and the rest of it is here on earth where those that have rejected God, have rejected the, the existence of Christ, that haven't believed in Christ, um, that, that, their, that, that their works haven't been, uh, haven't been good, they will remain here where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it's not so much that, that God has created this for humanity and he wants this for humanity, no. Uh, we say in the liturgy, um, in the, the karazuta or the, the petition of the deacon, uh, the nqom shapir, uh, one of the verses, um, and it's, it's in red because we only say it for holy days, holy feast days, um, and it says um, that God is not satisfied with the death of man, but that he repents and lives. So God, God wants humanity to be reconciled. God wants humanity to repent and to live with him eternally. But God will not, um, will not sort of enter into our free will and manipulate so that we can choose to love him. Mm. Um, our choosing is our own, is our free will. That is, that is, part of the creation that God has created us, God has given us that free will um, so that we can choose to love him out of our own choice, out of our own free, free will. Um, that's the definition there. So when we choose to love him uh, freely, without any obstacle, without any manipulation, without any um, over, um, over pressing sort of influence or factor, it's our own choice and that ultimately you know, we walk with God and we have this relationship with God that ultimately we want to be in his presence eternally. Yeah. Whereas there's people on earth that, you know, we've been talking about this for, for so long. Um, God's created them in his image. God's created them with love. God loves them, but they've chosen not to walk in, in, his, in, his, in his presence. They've chosen not to believe in him. They've chosen, they don't want a life with him everlasting. And so life without him everlasting will be, eternal damnation so that's yeah. that's how we view 
uh, that, that sort of concept. So it's not so much as like we, we kind of are shocked that God has created this. No, we've, you know, this, this is just the, the result of us not choosing him here on earth. Yeah. I mean, the majority of the things that I'm saying today, I learned from a book called uh, The Case for Christ, where it makes you think critically mm -hmm. about these topics that I brought up today. And uh, I, I owe it to Lee Strobel, who's the author of it. He was an atheist and, and he went on this investigative journey um, in discovering, you know, Jesus. And he asked all these hard questions. And one thing that I found really interesting that he wrote was he said, do you think God has an opinion about the Holocaust? Well, it's like, of course he does. You probably saw it as a bad thing. Well, mm -hmm. here on earth, where do we put the people who are not following the rules and the laws? You put them in jails, mm -hmm. prisons. And so obviously God is going to have a moral opinion about all of the atrocities on the face of the earth. And so he's going to need a place to put them because, well, that's what you do with people who break the rules and laws here. So it only makes yeah. sense that you would do it in the heavenly kingdom as well. And so... Another idea that he said is that heaven is not or hell is not a place that you go to because you didn't like a few rules about a religion and you didn't do enough good deeds. Yeah. It's the place you go to when you make yourself the center of the universe. And if you make yourself the center of the universe, so for example, you don't want to follow Christianity because um, it doesn't align with your sexual desires and inclivities. Okay, so you want to reject Christ to pursue your own pleasures. Mm -hmm you're your own center of the universe, you're your own God. Well, guess what? When you die, since you're your own God, there's no room for you in heaven because there's only room for one infinite God, mm -hmm. not you. Yeah. So you have to go somewhere else. But I guess my question would be now for clarification, is hell this giant pit of suffering and pain and gnashing of the teeth and there's fire and the devil's there and he's got big red horns and big tail with the spike and the pitchfork and all these things? Or... Is hell simply nothingness for the souls that didn't make it into heaven? Because it says it will give you eternal life. Mm -hmm. Does that mean like for those that made it, you get to live forever now? And those that didn't, you just simply just lights are on black. So the, the image that we get of, of, of eternal damnation is in the, the story of uh, Lazarus and the rich man, where uh, Lazarus is this man who is, is, is in poverty um, and he's living outside of the gates of a rich man. And the rich man comes and goes and um, doesn't pay him any mind, doesn't pay him any you know, attention, uh, doesn't cater to him, doesn't take care of him. Uh, and it says that the, this Lazarus, he has his body is full of sores and that the dogs come and they lick his sores. And it comes to their death. They both die. And it says that Lazarus is taken up into the, the bosom of Abraham or the... Uh, this place of comfort, whereas Lazarus is in this place of this abyss of, of suffering. And he calls on to Abraham and he calls on to Lazarus and he says, let Lazarus with a tip of his finger just put a drop on my tongue of water so that I can have some sort of comfort. And he says, there is a large gulf between us and you, that we can't cross over to you, you can't cross over to us. They see each other. And they see each other. Mm. And he says, okay, well, if he can't come to me, let him go to my family, my brothers, so that they can see and they can believe so that they don't end up here as well, where I'm suffering and there's pain and all this. And he says, if, if they, they will not believe, they will not, you know, they will, if, if they see a, man raised from the dead, they will not believe him either. Mm -hmm. So the, the, that's the only case or the only you know, scene, the image of suffering and, and that we understand this sort of like after death um, experience. Um, Christ does mention, the scriptures do mention the weeping and gnashing of teeth mm -hmm. that, that is going to be on, here on earth. Um, both are everlasting, everlasting life in the kingdom, in the presence of God, an everlasting life in uh, the the place of eternal suffering. Yeah, um, that is the sort of extent that we know, um, and and it's it's this place again where there is suffering. It is this place where there is death, spiritual death, 
um, that is just everlasting. There's no leaving and going back into, into heaven. There is no leaving this eternal damnation and, and going where, where God is. Um, and we sort of get this image from the Garden of Eden when they were in the garden and they were in the presence of God and there was, there was you know, the eternal blessing and, and everything that was necessary and, and, uh, and needed for, for human survival in the garden was there. And the moment they disobeyed, the moment they sinned, they were removed from that garden and then life began. Death entered, sin entered, uh, Satan entered. And that is what we see in, a, in an eternal sense, where they were outside of the presence of God. And because they were outside of the presence of God, so much death and destruction and, and things like that uh, were, were, were happening to them. So now you're looking at an eternal. Uh, to sort of a- answer the part of regarding Satan, um, Satan isn't, you know, the, the red pitchfork with, you know, the horns and things like that. Yeah, he's that. beautiful, you know, isn't he? It's, uh, he was an angel. Yeah. So we have, you know, that he's enticing, he's a deceiver. So all of these things are, are what we look at based on scripture and, and, and how we sort of perceive um, life and life after death. It's really interesting. And revelations, I, I, I told you, I finished the, uh, the New Testament recently last Sunday. So like mm-hmm. everyone's like smiling and, and praising God. I'm like in the middle of revelations, I'm reading it in the middle of the, the service. <laughs> I'm like, yo, this is crazy. <laughs> uh, anyways, so has there, has, has there ever been a thing as easy Christianity? Because we expect things easy today. Yeah. You know, like, oh, when we have hardships, why can't we pray them away? Yeah. And I have a follow-up question to that. Yeah. No, easy, easy Christianity, the early church um, teaches us and shows us that uh, the way, and Christ himself shows us that is, Christianity is not easy. Mm-hmm. Um, nowhere do the scriptures say, nowhere does Christ say that if you follow me, um, life will be easy. Mm-hmm. He does tell us that his his yoke is light, the the burden is light. If we depend on him, if we give up our um, our burdens to him, and he will carry them for us. When but, he says yoke is light, he means the tool, the farming contraption, yes. with the oxen, where you attach the two oxen together. He's saying his yoke is light. It's not heavy. On, it's not going to be a burden on your shoulders. Yes, basically. yes. He carries the weight. He carries the, the burden. You know how many people would be like, I thought he meant egg, egg yolk. yolk. Yeah. yeah, it's not even spelled that way. So yeah. I don't know that right. people need to do some more research. But yeah, yeah the, 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 the burden is light when we give it up to him. But that doesn't mean the walk of Christ, walking spiritually is, is easy. Um, you have so many... First of all, you have carnal desires that, have, that your own flesh is battling your spirit, um, that, that's one. Mm. Then you're in the world and the world is not, um, is not a spiritual world. The world is not catering to, to us as Christians, as, as spiritual people. You see the temptations, the, the lust, the so much, so much, um, immorality going Mm -hmm. on. And, And again, we talk about, um, life being a spiritual battle between the principalities of this world and the spiritual realm um and so it's not it's not an easy walk for christianity the early christians talk about um the sacrifice that we take as christians when we're baptized we're being baptized unto christ's death and burial and resurrection to give us sort of a foreshadow of our own lives that we have to have we have to die to self and we live for christ and that means the 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 passions of our of the life um we're we're crucifying those and we're walking in christ um that means you know the the self-centered uh the ego the um the lusts of the body Mm -hmm. uh, those are all things that we have to crucify and we have to walk a certain way that that is difficult um then you look at life again we talk about how people view us and how people treat us and how you know, our walk is, is difficult. And, and luckily in, in America, I think, you know, it's a different type of difficult from you know, what our parents or grandparents and forefathers experienced in the Middle East, where it was, you know, physical war and persecution. Right. And Ours like is that. more temptation based. Theirs yes. was life threatening. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, and, and not to compare at all but you know even ours is one that's leading into into a spiritual death if mm-hmm. we're not careful so um it's definitely a, a difficult difficult walk um but all things are possible and all things 
um, we receive our strength through Christ. So Christ didn't tell us that it's going to be easy. Um, today's Christianity and today's world of a lot of times we, when we pray, we pray for things to be given. We pray for things to, you know, we, we want this thing, we want this. We yeah, treat, treat God like a genie. Exactly. And, and that's not, that's not what, what Christ taught us. That's not what Christ is instructing us. That's not how we ought to be viewing our relationship with God. Uh, rather, when we're praying, it's a sense of gratitude for the grace and the mercy He's bestowed upon us. Everything that we do, we have to look at it from a spiritual lens. Um, and so it's not so much of like this physical world that we're asking God. In our prayer, we ask for blessing, we ask for health, and we ask, and, but God already knows to provide these things for us. You know, Christ gives us the, the image of, you know, the birds of the air, um, they don't, they don't spin so or toil or so, but God provides for them. Matthew how six, much eight. more, how much more for, for us, for his, for his creation, his, his own image. Yeah. Um, so again, it's not a life of, you know, I want this, I need this. And, and I was, I was teaching the children's ministry on Monday and one of the girls were talking about the Lord's prayer and asking. And she said that a lot of times when we pray, we're not, we're not praying for, for, uh, needs, we're praying for wants, mm. which is a very good way for a eight year old girl to put. Sure. Is, um, we, we pray Christianity today has become sort of this relationship, like you said, where we're praying for things that we want. Mm. Um, and, and we have to change that view where we're, where we're praying and asking for God's will to be done in our life, for God to guide us, for God to strengthen us, for God to, you know, we're th really thanking God and, and just depending on him for all his mercies and graces. And so our walk in Christianity is not is not an easy one. Yeah, um, it never was. It never was. Uh, following God of the Old Testament was not an, was not an easy compared to the other nations. Um, you had to be dependent on God. You had to be trusting in God as difficult as it was, um, as laborious as it was, but it was rewarding eternally. Um, same thing with our relationship with Christ. And, and with Christ, you know, this is the love and the mercy that, that Christ, whatever was in the Old Testament and was... Um, was unknown and was mysterious and was difficult to comprehend. Christ, it was revealed through Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Christ became a friend to us, uh, you know, and he said that there's no greater love than this, that man gives up his life for his friends. And so that, that's, the, that's the eternal, um, that's the salvific plan. That is the love story. That is the scriptures that, that, that Christ, who is God, came down on earth, dwelt among us, and wants to be our friend, wants to have this relationship with us. So yeah. it's not an easy walk, but it's a beautiful friendship to have, and it's, a, it's the most perfect friend to have and to rely on and to call upon during your hardships in, in this world. Got it. One last question. So let's consider this then, uh, tying that back into the last question. So I'm going to give an analogy. I would like your opinion about the analogy, and then I'll, I'll follow up with the question. Mm -hmm. So let's say that a person, when they order a package online, they don't really care how it gets delivered to them. Amazon, UPS, FedEx, whatever. Mm -hmm. They just care if they get the package or not, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't change the fact that a specific person delivered that package. Mm -hmm. So they could deny it or not care who, who got it to their front door. They eventually got the thing that they're asking for. Yeah. Um, but there indeed was a person a specific person that delivered that package. So when uh, a person came to me and they asked me, they go, hey, in your next interview, can, do you mind uh, asking this question? I go, okay. They said, can you ask the priest, why is it that people, if we follow such a just God and if we're following the right religion, why is it that other people and other religions get their prayers answered, but I don't get mine when I'm a follower of Christ? Mm -hmm. I said that analogy to her and also said, just because they don't recognize that their uh, prayers are being given to them by Jesus doesn't mean that it isn't being given to them by Jesus. It is. It's just they're not, they're, they're thinking that it's coming from their God. So what do you have to say about that? Is that close to what you would say? Is that off mm -hmm. of your uh, perspective? Well, again, the, the, the part of prayer um, where we're asking for things and they're getting answered um, we cannot solely encompass our prayer life based on what we receive and based on what we don't receive. Mm. 
Um, a lot of times we may be asking for things that aren't good for us. God is always good and just in what he's going to give us. Um, God is also going to put us in situations that um, are timely for us. Some things may not be in their time. Mm -hmm. Some things may not be good for us. Some things may not be right for us. What we ask for is based solely on our understanding of what is right for me, um, what is good for me, what I want, what I need. Um, but our Heavenly Father knows more and knows better what we want and what we need and what is good for us. There's also this other aspect of, let's say I'm praying um, for patience, right? Or I'm praying for um, not to give in to temptation, right? God is not going to just remove temptation. Now, God is not just going to remove um, a, a person or a situation so that I have patience now. No, but God will present me with an opportunity and the strength to have patience in that certain mm. situation. God is going to remove not the temptation, but he will strengthen me in order to overcome. So mm. now it's on me to also then give in and, and, and strengthen my, my spirit so that my spirit can overcome my flesh. Allow my spirit to overcome my flesh, to overcome that temptation, to overcome that addiction, to overcome that problem, that, that you know, anger, that pride, that whatever I have. So a lot of times um, we view things from a flesh perspective, from a perspective that I'm looking at this one way, I'm not looking at it from a spiritual way. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking at you know, this person, and instead of looking at this person as an opportunity for me to you know, grow in kindness, to grow in patience, to grow in whatever, um, I'm looking at this person as a thorn in my flesh. And this person is, I can't, I need God to get rid of this person for me. But as St. Paul says, through those weaknesses, God is glorified. Through my weaknesses, God is strengthened, uh, or, or Christ strengthens me by my weaknesses. Mm -hmm. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. So when I'm weak, um, those are opportunities for me to really dig in and based on the strength that Christ provides me, for me to be strong. So again, our prayers, we have to start looking at like the fine lining, uh, the silver lining in, 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 our, in our circumstances. Um, we cannot compare the circumstances of others with our situation mm -hmm. and say that this person's prayers are being answered, mine aren't being answered. Right. Because a lot of times then, again, we depend or we, we, we measure success of prayer based on what this person has and what I don't have. Yeah, and plus... Or what I have and what that person... You know, when they're praying, there could be another person listening on the other end of the line. You know, like Satan could be easily tricking you into believing that the thing you're praying for is a gift from God, but yeah. it could be a curse from the devil. Mm -hmm. It all It's all perspective and it's all, uh, you know, it all depends. And it really, we have to align with God's will. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, we have to look at these opportunities. We have to look at these situations and, and look for the silver lining and say, how can I um, fulfill God's will in this certain circumstance? Is this producing the fruits of the Spirit in my life? Yeah. Um, how can I produce the fruits of the Spirit based on this circumstance? So the more we look at it that way, the more we'll actually see our prayers being answered. But, you know, to define like... Uh, uh, you know, financial success or status success or anything like that and compare and say that this is a result of my prayers being answered or this is a result of my prayers not being answered, that is, uh, it's a little bit of, uh, it's transactional almost. Mm -hmm. It becomes transactional with, with God where that's not really how we, you know, that's not how we look at prayer and, and mm -hmm. prayer life. It's not a transactional kind of um, relationship that we have. I see. Father Andrew, I've taken enough of your time. Um, Amo, thank you very much for this opportunity. I, I truly did enjoy the conversation. I hope that we can um, do this again. Uh, sure. But this this specific um, conversation, I pray that it's fruitful for all of us that were here and all the listeners. And, and I pray that God continues to um, bless your podcast and to continue to pour forth blessing onto you and all the listeners and God bless you guys, man. This is, a, this is a beautiful thing that you guys are doing. So thank you. keep it up. Appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. Awesome.